Good afternoon. I want to ask everyone in the room to please put their cell phones on silent. You may notice board members accessing their laptops, phones, and other devices during the meeting. They are using their devices to access board meeting materials that are in electronic format. This is an official meeting, business meeting of the Medical Board of California. As such, disruptions of the board's business will not be tolerated. We have designated time on the agenda for public comment and ask for public comment on each agenda item. I ask that you be respectful of the need to conduct the board's business. Should anyone disrupt the meeting, I will ask that person to conduct him or herself in such a manner that permits the board to transact its business. The board welcomes public comments on any item on the agenda, and it is the board's intent for public comments prior to the board taking action on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, please raise your hand and come forward and you will be recognized. I would like to request all speakers complete a presenter slip so that I can call you by name at the appropriate time and that the recording of the meeting can be full and complete. This is voluntary. Please give the slip to Ms. Cruz Jones. Ms. Cruz Jones, can you identify yourself? Thank you um, for the audience. I will do my best to call upon everyone who has supplied a slip for the agenda item and recognize those who wish to make last minute comments. This meeting will be available via teleconference. Individuals listening to the meeting will have an opportunity to provide public comment and will be assisted by a moderator who will be facilitating the teleconference process. For those members of the public participating via teleconference, please wait until the moderator has introduced you before you make your comments. To request to make a comment, comment during the public comment period, press star one and you will hear a tone indicating you are in queue for comment. If you change your mind and do not wish to make a comment, press star two. Assistance is available throughout the teleconferencing meeting. To request a specialist, press star zero. Each person will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. However, that time frame may be subject to change depending upon the number of speakers on a topic. During agenda item two, public comments on items not on the agenda, the board has limited the total public comment period for individuals on the teleconference to 20 minutes. In addition to the total public comment for individuals here at the meeting will also be 20 minutes. Therefore, after 20 minutes, no further comments will be accepted during the public comment or on any other agenda item. 10 minutes will be allowed for the total comment period from individuals on the teleconference and 10 minutes for those in the audience. After 10 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. Each person will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. Business services office staff will be assisting me with receiving the public comments via teleconference during this meeting. I wanna remind all speakers to please stay on topic and keep your comments to three minutes or less. Today's meeting will run according to the Open Meeting Act as required by law. We plan to end today around 5.30. If you are a member of the media and require assistance or information, please see the board's public information manager, Carlos Villa Toro. Thank you, Carlos. Are there anyone in the audience? Okay. Um, I would like to call the meeting to order and ask that Ms. Cruz Joan please call the roll. Dr. Bolat? Here. Ms. Friedman? Here. Dr. Gonadev? Here. Dr. Hawkins? Here. Dr. Kraus? Present. Ms. Lawson? Here. Ms. Lubiano? Here. Dr. Lewis? Present. Ms. Sutton Wills? Mr. Warmoth? Here. Ms. Wright? Here. Dr. Yip? Here. Ms. Pines? Here. We have a quorum. I would like to remind the members again that we will be taking roll call and a vote on all action items. Moving to agenda item two, public comment on items not on the agenda. 
Before we invite speakers to come forward, I would ask individuals making comments to not discuss pending complaints, pending licensing applications, or pending disciplinary actions that may come before the board for a decision. Such discussions are considered ex parte communications as they could provide information to members that is outside the record in violation of the Administrative Protection Act, Procedure Act. Therefore, such discussions could create a conflict and lead to a board decision being challenged in superior court. The board can receive comments regarding the board's processes in general, but cannot receive comments on specific case circumstances where the decision is still pending. Board staff is available to speak with you about any pending matter. In addition, the board would like the public to address the board as a whole and not individual members. Please be aware that public comment during this agenda item should provide information to the board members and is not a discussion between the board members and the public. The only action board members can take is to listen to comments and decide whether they want a future agenda item on the topic. No other action can be taken on the item at this, me at this meeting. Though this may seem at times like the board members are not being responsive, Following these guidelines is critical to ensure the rules of the Open Meeting Act are followed to avoid compromising the speaker's goals or the board's missions. Okay, I have the following speaker slips here. Um, Hannah Ree, please come forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There you go. Yes, uh, good afternoon, members of the medical board and staff. Uh, my name is Hannah Ree, and uh, MD, and I am the co founder of Black Patients Matter. First of all, I'd like to sincerely apologize um, for my previous overzealous uh, inflammatory comments to the board at the previous meeting as I am just really deeply um, passionate about underrepresented patient care. This, this likely is my final presentation as my hearing is next week and will likely result in the revocation of my medical license. Um, as the executive member of the uh, Ethnic Medical Organization section of the CMA and a member of the BPM, I just wanted to present to you that uh, we've done quite a bit of research into um, into uh, uh, patient, uh, excuse me, into uh, bias, and our research has shown that, um, in fact, uh, as you know, many of us probably already know, underrepresented minority patients um, actually improve significantly while under the care of providers of their own race, and whereas other studies. Um, have also shown a somewhat um, recalcitrant, non-diversified investigative and policing force maintains a racial bias at times. It should be of no surprise that our organization has filed another federal civil rights lawsuit against the California Department of Consumer Affairs as their division of investigation lacks significant racial diversity. Therefore, we call for increased racial and religious uh, diversity within the DOI. It seems that there is a lack of studies uh, which shows a significant improvement even after um, what, what we call the implicit bias training. We at BPM call for the board call for the board's medical experts to therefore be um, have certain criteria. Number one, to be an active practice, and number two, for at least fifty percent of their patient population to be racially diversified, including underrepresented minority groups, if they wish to be uh, medical board ex medical experts. And here I have um, a significant uh, published uh, information uh, supporting uh, these statements. May I submit to the board? Thank you. Thank you. Edward Hollingsworth.
Afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Edward Hollingsworth. I'm affiliated with the Patient Safety League. Now, this is not a current complaint. This is from a patient's actual medical records. The patient was diagnosed with four hernias. He went in for laparoscopic surgery on two of them in the fall of 2015. Three months later, all of his symptoms had returned, so he went back to see the surgeon. She took no responsibility and blamed the surgery failure on his weak genes. She redid the surgery in the fall of 2016, and three months later, all of his symptoms had once again returned. The patient went back to see her again, and she wanted to do a third surgery. No longer trusting that she knew what she was doing, he sought out a second opinion from another surgeon. Now, with two-thirds of his stomach up inside his chest cavity due to the failed previous attempts, he went in for a third surgery with the new surgeon in the fall of 2017, which went very well, aside from the fact that they sent him home with an eight-inch surgery incision fully open under his bandages, causing him to be admitted for further care. Now, this procedure, called a fullness and fundoplication, they take the top of the stomach and stitch it around to the lower esophagus to reinforce it, making it less likely for acid to reflux from the stomach. In the patient's medical records, the new surgeon wrote, at this point, it became clear as to the significance of the adhesions. I now started to separate all of the liver from the scar tissue that was quite dense. The scar was so dense that it obscured any sense of normal anatomy. I was uncertain where the stomach and esophagus started because of the dense scar tissue. At this point, it became very clear that the scar tissue and the inability to identify the anatomy as a result of it would make proceeding with the operation any further too dangerous. We had done a great deal laparoscopically, but could not complete it to its end and still be safe. Therefore, I made the incision larger. Now I was able to see what was clearly the wrap. There were sutures of the wrap, but unfortunately the wrap was not sutured to the esophagus. It was sutured to the stomach itself. This is likely why it was not functioning. Now, after reading his medical record, the patient filed a medical board complaint against the first surgeon for putting him through two dangerous surgeries and doing them both wrong, leaving him with adhesions that could complicate things for him later in life. Adhesions can lead to bowel strangulation, which in turn can lead to death. Adhesions are the most common cause of small bowel obstruction in the United States, roughly 50 to 70 percent of all cases. Now, the complaint was filed on April 30th, 2018, and after battling with a seemingly incompetent staff member by the name of Amandeep Kaur, the complaint was closed without investigation on February 13th, 2019. Thank you for your time, guys. Thank you. Eric Andrus. So today I'm here in honor of my sister's 66th birthday. The doctor you let get away with her death is enjoying the day while she can't. So the patient in this case is me. Not only did this board let the doctor who killed my sister get away with it, you've now let a doctor who has permanently harmed me get away with it as well. Mr. Warmoth accused us at the last meeting of being out for revenge, but it's really looking like this board is taking revenge on my speaking out against you now that you've closed two cases of clear negligence. How can any of you sit up there and look at the evidence that this surgeon did that, that, and it doesn't prove a negligent act? This surgeon screwed up not once, but two surgeries on me, causing me to have a third, and the new surgeon called out her errors in my medical records. That's not beyond the standard of care. Do you really think that the majority of other surgeons are making the same errors and making people go through this many surgeries? This really calls into question the qualifications of the people making these decisions for this board, especially after hearing this morning the hearing that brought out that one of your experts is incompetent and corrupt, something that we will be looking into. And by the way, the two nurses that aided and abetted my sister's death were each just placed on three years of probation by the nursing board, while this board refused to even investigate the doctor who was ultimately responsible for her death, which is why you have to deal with me now. Both the nursing board and the contractor state license board actually called and interviewed me at length while this board refused to. 
Ironically, while I was going through my third surgery, medical board investigator Ellen Coleman came to my hospital room not to interview me about my case, but to interview me, my partner and I over a case he filed with yet another doctor, which is still ongoing. So why was there an interview in his complaint, but not in either of mine? Do you really think it's out of line for us to consider that this board is taking its own revenge now? Almost every accusation that you put out contains inadequate medical records as a cause for discipline, and yet this board is closing consumer complaints based solely on medical records, which don't paint an entire portrait, and, and after, especially when you're refusing to listen to a victim's own verbal testimony. It's ludicrous. You're not punishing me by closing my complaints. You're putting consumers that come after me in danger. You close these complaints, but you punish Dr. Zaza Atinalov, license 161432, for being convicted of making a loud noise. My sister died. Now that's public protection, don't you think? You can all sit up there until you're blue in the face and complain about us complaining about all of you, but that's our right, our freedom of speech. You can just look to yourselves for breaching your own duty to protect consumers from bad doctors. We're not going anywhere. We're going to continue to expose all of your faults while going to, uh, well, and coming to the board meetings and going to continue letting the press know why, when you screw up. By the way, how did you all like our report on NBCLA after the last meeting? They did a pretty good job, huh? You should all be ashamed allowing doctors on the sex offender registry to continue practicing. We just hooked up with a major national news network who's going to be doing an in-depth investigation of this board. So be prepared. Thank you. Marianne Hollingsworth. Good afternoon. My name is Marianne Hollingsworth, and I'm a patient safety advocate with the Patient Safety League and the Patient Safety Action Network. I would like to request that the medical board have an agenda item at the next meeting dealing with the recent Trump administration's conscience ruling. You're probably already all aware of this, but in case you aren't, this ruling allows doctors and other healthcare professionals to refuse to treat patients for such things as birth control, abortion, or assisted suicide, if doing so violates their religious beliefs. There is a concern among advocate groups that this is a Pandora's box for healthcare and could substantially affect the well-being and health of certain groups, particularly women and members of the LGBTQ community. I would like the medical board to formulate a plan on how to deal with the conscience ruling if it appears as part of a consumer complaint. I understand that each case must be considered separately. However, there is the possibility that the use of religion in a case can be abused. Uh, in a case a couple of years ago, um, a uh, Bakersfield doctor appeared to use his religion as a tool for getting his license reinstated. He has lost his license for sexual misconduct with three women. At his panel, he claimed that he had rediscovered God and had a glowing letter from his pastor testifying on how faith had changed him. He had moved to Texas and claimed he needed his California license reinstated before Texas would allow him to practice there where his family and church were. You gave him his license back and shortly after that, this doctor moved back to Bakersfield where his troubles had started. I would hope the board would apply this conscience ruling fairly and not allow doctors to abuse it. I encourage you to have an agenda item at the next meeting to present how you plan to implement this new policy in your investigations. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any comments on the phone? We do have public comment from the phone. Susan Lauren, your line is open. <clears throat> Hi. How long will it take? How many more plastic surgeons are you going to give a free pass to kill or surgically batter and maim innocent people such as myself? Your corrupt system cuts out the role of the police and DA in even the most extreme cases of surgical battery. The acts of your board go against your statutory duty and are unbecoming to human dignity. Each time you fail to protect the public, you are complicit. Science shows that adipose removal is bad for people. There are thousands of valid citizen complaints about how their bodies and lives were ruined by liposuction and the surgeons covered up the harm. The board-certified plastic surgeon I was referred to for breast reduction removed my gluteus, infragluteal ligaments, parts of hamstrings, waist, and more, without need or consent. 
He cut me in dozens of muscular zones, stabbed my sciatic notch, knee joints, and bony trochanter. The surgical plan doesn't match what he did. My doctor wrote you that I'm permanently scarred, disabled, disfigured, and in constant pain. My life has been irreversibly changed for the worse as a direct result of the overly aggressive and unconsented surgery performed on me. He said the procedure constitutes surgical assault. My doctor explained that the surgeon perjured himself in sworn testimony when he flatly denied doing the surgery he did. Other doctors demonstrated and testified I was not a candidate. The surgeon caused me serious bodily harm. Consent was not obtained, and what he did was negligent and below the standard of care. I sent you uh, videos, photos, documents of the atrocities, yet I've watched these meetings online. Your staff looks bored and unmoved when I speak. I don't feel compassion. Compassion is shown through acknowledgement, action, and accountability. My injuries are so horrendous and easily apparent that even untrained laymen can see these injuries could not be medically justified under any circumstances and were the result of gross negligence. Any doctor, insurance company, lawyer, judge, or medical board should not have been able to reach any other honest conclusion than that I was surgically battered and a denial of this shows a breach of professional ethics. After engaging in medical, ethical, and criminal misconduct, the medical board gave the unremorseful surgeon and his unscrupulous independent counsel who reviews cases for you carte blanche. You blew it with my case. What you did is not okay. More women have been harmed as a result, and you need to make this right. There is a new patient safety movement in California called Epic Harm. That stands for Epidemic Preventable Iatrogenic Citizen-Based Harm. The Medical Board of California re-traumatizes victims of medical harm by denial and gaslighting, which is a psychological torture. It's similar to Holocaust deniers. The harm caused to adults causes trauma to children and communities. Thank you. Are there any other comments on the phone? We do have another comment. Conwar Gill, Family Health Care Network. Your line is open. Hello, my name is Conwar Gill, but I am making comment in my personal com- capacity and not um, um, as my employer's uh, role in it. So the purpose of my call is to, you know, I'm usually critical of board conduct, but what I've noticed recently is the, the effectiveness of a board action in a Sonoma physician, Clinton Lane, who's been recklessly prescribing medications um, with an extreme departure from standard of care uh, since about 2012. What worries me is although Ms. Kirkmeyer's staff did an excellent job in pursuing this matter, and so did the attorney of record, um, the initial complaint originated roughly around um, 2012, when it took almost uh, seven years to bring it to a meaningful conclusion. So maybe we would need to designate more staff or more resources to pursue these kind of measures because there are doctors out there who are doing it um, and it's pretty reckless in the in the places we see it and unfortunately the time it takes to discipline them is not something that is reasonable second thing that i intend to um, talk about is that board should make an effort to kind of take it to the governor's office to um, bring up some sort of a training as mandatory for medication-assisted treatment for opioid office-based um, uh, treatment. Uh, right now, I work for a group. We have about over 200 providers, but we couldn't find a single doctor who would be willing, outside of me, to come on board for the MAT program. So that's the challenge we are facing. We have an opioid crisis, which has been partly created by the medical board's previous regulation requiring doctors to prescribe and over-treat pain, but board has not made significant uh, effort in forcing doctors to take training for uh, de-addiction medication-assisted programs. So that is something I would want board to look into. And again, you know, the, uh, the team did a great job um, disciplining a physician, and it's one of those instances where I believe the conduct of the medical board enforcement staff deserve praise. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments on the phone? No further comments on the phone at this time. Okay. Moving to agenda item three, approval of meeting minutes from the January 31st, February 1st, 2019 quarterly board meeting. So moved. Oh, one second. You move too fast. 
before we begin, um, I'd like to acknowledge that we have actually an edit um, to the meetings that was brought before the board's attention by the public. On page BRD 3-34, the second paragraph, first sentence, the word meeting should be changed to records. The comment was regarding the Public Records Act, not the Meeting Act. So our motion should day, today should include the inclusion of that edit. And if there's any additional um, edit, ed, additions or corrections by any board members. No. Okay, so. So, so moved with the addition of that edit. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Are there any public comments? Eric? No public comment at this time. <laughs> I've been going through a lot of the old minutes from meetings gone by, and I found a couple of interesting things. First, it's amazing how many things are brought up by consumers in the audience and on the phone that never get addressed and are never brought up again. It must be an NBC motto, out of sight, out of mind. So that's one of my next projects for the next meeting, to remind you of some of the important things that people have brought up that are recorded in the minutes that you dismiss and never deal with. For instance, in the minutes for agenda item five, I brought up Ms. Wright leaving the meeting for over 30 minutes to commandeer our guest Charles Johnson and how she didn't divulge that as a communication with interested parties. I asked that my complaint against her be looked into and no one followed up with me on it and I don't see it mentioned anywhere in the agenda for this meeting. So again, out of sight, out of mind. But as I said last meeting, I'll bring it up each time until it is addressed. No, I'm still going. Please, please let him continue with, so he can have his three minutes. And two, it's really unsettling how whoever writes them and skews them to not really relate the real essence of what goes on in these meetings. It's often very sugar-coated. I understand you don't have to write down what people say verbatim, but here's a good example of what I alluded to. I want to play a clip of Mr. Wormuth from the last meeting, and granted his diatribe pointed at me, I mean consumers, was longer than this clip, but this is the part I'm concerned with. Oops. I question whether or not you are doing what you say you're doing, which is to try and improve this board and our activities, or whether you're seeking revenge for something that seems to have has occurred in the past that could very well be an instance where this board has failed you. Y'all remember him accusing us of wanting revenge? Mr. Wormuth stated he valued, uh, and here's how it's explained in the minutes. Mr. Wormuth stated he valued public comments that are received and noted that they are very helpful. He asked that staff develop a best practices document on how to most effectively testify to the board. Not really an accurate representation of what his statement and purpose was. Neither his request or my request to have the Public Record Act topic put on the agenda were followed through on for this meeting. Oh, and I brought show and tell posters based on the law. If any other board members wants to try and censor the public at this meeting like Mr. Wormuth and Dr. Krause have done in the past. It really boggles my mind that you guys all want to try and ignore us and punish us as much as possible when you can clearly see we have no intention of giving up. You'd think by now you'd want to be working with us and mitigate us calling out your weaknesses and illegal activities all the time. Carrie won't even respond to my legal questions anymore by email, which I find highly unprofessional and not in the name of patient safety. Shame on you, Carrie. As the great Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel said, always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Thank you. Thank you. And we can take that outside afterwards. Ms. Cruz Jones, please perform the roll call. Dr. Bolot? Aye. Ms. Friedman? Aye. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Aye. 
Dr. Yip? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. The minutes are approved. I'm now moving to agenda item four, President's Report. The Medical Board of California spent much of the first quarter working hard to meet our objectives for enhancing consumer protection with new laws like the Patient's Right to Know Act, SB 1448. In the past, consumers proactively could check their, with their board to learn about their physician's license. With this law in place, on or after July 1st, 2019, a physician who has been placed on probation for certain offenses will be required to inform and discuss their probation status with their patients. Dr. Lewis and I have had calls with executive staff to discuss the meeting agenda and other projects. In our efforts for more transparency with the public, we had our first ever open notice meeting with patient advocates on February 1st. That included Dr. Lewis, myself, as well as other members and staff. It was an important moment for the board to listen to patient advocates' concerns, as well as share the board's complex complaints process, the board's role, and the enforcement efforts. As a result of the meeting, I directed the board staff to look into several items in the way the board processes complaints. The board wants to provide more information about what to expect when a complaint is filed and how the complaint process moves forward. There was a recommendation regarding an online portal to see the progress of a complaint. This information has been discussed with the Department of Consumer Affairs and work is being done to see if that is possible. A work group was put together for the enforcement staff to identify better ways to communicate during the completing of the complaint form and filling out the medical releases. In addition, the work group is going to be reviewing the board's website to ensure information is laid out in an easy to understand format. The board is also looking at releasing a video regarding the complaint process. Finally, staff is looking at ways to provide more communication to the complainant more frequently during the process. So that meeting really um, gave us a lot of insight. We really heard a lot of what the patient advocates had concerns about and we are really moving very fast to address as many of those as we can. Um, the board had previously heard from one patient advocate regarding the language the board posts on the physician's profile if there is no documents available. The language did not take into consideration that while there may be an action, it didn't meet the board's requirements for posting. But based upon this feedback, the board changed the language on the website to state quote unquote, no information to meet the criteria for posting. In addition, if a consumer was to click that language, it would take them to the board's public disclosure matrix to explain if the information is, to explain what the information is, sorry, and what is not on the website. In addition, a patient advocate also requested the board to add a link to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services open payments website. This website lists payments made by drug and medical device companies to visit to physicians and teaching hospitals. The board added that link on the board's online license search website page. The board is also looking to update the medical consultant program and develop a training component for the medical consultants in the central complaint unit. This would be either be a webinar or in-person training. The board is continuing to determine where other enhancements can be made based upon the feedback we received. Two weeks ago, I participated in the House of Delegates meeting for the Federation of State Medical Boards. The Federation adopted several re res resolutions and policies. I would like to thank the Federation for making this meeting accessible to me via teleconference since we could not travel to the meeting due to state restrictions. And lastly, I would like to thank Julie D'Angelo Felmuth, um, and I would like to ask her to come um, forward. I would like to take a few minutes to acknowledge the work Ms. Felmuth, not only in her career with the, Central, the Center for Public Interest Law, but specifically her role with the board. Over the years, she has prioritized consumer protection, 
collaborated with the board in the interest of, public, of the public, and provided support, expertise, and constructive criticism to a number of projects of the board. Her initial and final report as the board's enforcement program monitor assisted the board in not only making needed internal process changes, but also brought about legislation changes that provided the board more authority and enhanced consumer protection. Ms. Felmuth has been a leader in consumer protection and ensuring that not only the medical board was meeting its mission, but other state entities were doing the same. I would like to thank her for her work and her hard work and dedication, and would like to present her with this plaque as a token of the board's appreciation for the work she has done. I personally want to thank her for always providing us with the wisdom that comes with historical context so that we know what we don't need to repeat and keep processing and, progr and, pro and progressing forward. Um, this was most notable as we explored the Physicians Health and Wellness Program. Your wisdom and insight will be missed, and we would like to congratulate you on your retirement. Please come forward. Thank you very much for this recognition. I have been attending medical board meetings as a representative of the Center for Public Interest Law for 33 years, uh, longer than any of you or your, any of your staff. I think 33 years is enough. Uh, over those many years, I am now on my sixth governor. As governors come and go, I have gone through about six iterations of this board's membership seven executive directors, six or seven enforcement chiefs, and three senior assistant attorneys general at the health quality enforcement section at the AG's office, which I am proud to say CPIL created in a bill that we wrote in 1990 in an attempt to strengthen your physician discipline system so that it better protects patients. We have sued you. We have complained to you. We have complained about you. But hopefully along the way, some of those Many bills that we have sponsored and written and supported have strengthened your physician discipline process and its patient protection priority. And we did not confine our efforts to legislation. We also filed numerous amicus curiae briefs in important litigation in support of this board and its enforcement program. I have attended scores of meetings of other boards within the department and outside the department, but it's fair to say that I have devoted the bulk of my career to this board and the profession that it regulates. Um, because of the importance of what you do and the significance of the harm that can be caused by physicians who are negligent, reckless, or impaired if you do not stop them or if you are not able to stop them. And in all of that time, some of the finest people I have met and worked with in my, throughout my entire career were members or staff of this board and the Attorney General's office. I think this board has made great strides toward better public protection during the past 33 years. Obviously, there is always room for improvement, and I hope you will continue in that direction. I urge you to listen to the patient advocates who take their time to speak to you the way I have for the last 33 years. And if you think this is the last time you will ever hear from me, <laughs> you, are, you are wrong. <laughs> I'm not dead. I'm just retired, Dr. Garladev. <laughs> I am finally retired. <laughs> I can and will be here at the drop of a hat should circumstances so require, and should I still have a brain in my head. And my successor, Bridget Grammy, is here today, and she will be here to fill my shoes for the next 33 years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for this honor. I need to stop here, because if I don't, I will just start to cry, and none of us need to see that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Are there any questions or comments from members on the President's 
report. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, uh, Ms. Falmouth, I can tell you that there is so much we learned from you. Mm -hmm. uh, we might have disagreed on a few things. We agreed on a lot of things, but uh, it was very, very, uh, I mean, I can tell you, excellent experience for you to be here. We truly going to miss you. Dr. Hawkins. Uh, Denise, do you remember which members of the public were at that meeting uh, that you had with staff? Who were the public? Who were the more board members? Public members. At which one? Interested parties? The interested parties meeting that you had. Uh, the first one of the nature we've had with the uh, president meeting with. Um, the one on February 1st? I don't remember the date. I wasn't there, but you mentioned oh. specifically that. Uh, the there were staff. Staff. There were met, not they met with public members. I don't know the names. Okay, I misunderstood. Of all the then. I misunderstood. Oh, okay. Oh. Yes. Uh, hello, uh, Dr. Ree here with Black Patients Matter. Um, I just wanted to comment on the the absolutely wonderful. Um, uh, forum that you had uh, for the patient advocates group to get together and, and to talk with everyone. That was wonderful. Um, we just asked, we at Black Patients Matter just asked to be part of any kind of communications that are happening um, w from the board to patient advocate groups. Uh, it seems that um, for whatever reason, um, we're not privy to the same communications as um, some of the other advocate groups. And I'm just asking that we be included, uh, we at Black Patients Matter, and I can provide our email address, of course. And so, um, again, don't, don't forget about us um, when you discuss uh, patient advocate groups. Thank you. Thank you. We, we always post those. Are you, I think you're, are you on the email? Have you signed up for our newsletter? We, um, we make sure that that information for the, that goes out about anything publicly is, is is out there. Yes, it, it does seem that perhaps the um, the the way in which you do it, um, we it seems that we have not received emails that um, the other uh, advocacy groups had received. And so, you know, whatever system you utilize, um, just, you know, include us. So okay. Thank, thank you. you. Come forward. I think she's talking about the public meeting was originally supposed to be private and in L.A. Yeah. I don't think she was noticed on that. I just want to echo, too. I'm going to miss Julie, too. I think she is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank her personally for everything. It's going to make me cry now talking about it. <laughs> I only wish I could aspire to be as graceful and as knowledgeable as she is. And I know I never, ever will. And I'm sure you all will agree with that. But <laughs> she is just awesome. I think she is just fantastic. So please do try to stick around when you can. Um, I had a very different take on the public advocate meeting. I found it to be a fiasco. From the beginning when it was a private meeting and you guys made it so that disabled people couldn't attend and couldn't call in. And then once we got, it got switched up to Northern California, which made it difficult for people who had planned to be there who then couldn't go. Once we got there, you guys spent an hour talking about things that 90% of the people in the room already knew, which took half of the time away from the advocates, and it was an advocate meeting. I didn't even get to speak. I spent weeks preparing packets of information to pack out to pass out to all of you. I didn't get to present it. I didn't get to talk. I, I commented a couple times on what other people said, but I didn't even get to speak because you guys took so long talking about information that we all already knew. I found the, the meeting was a fiasco. So I'm I, another thing, this is another way I feel like you're sugarcoating what went on because that meeting, most to most of the advocates, was horrible. Thank you for your opinion. Um, are there any comments on the phone? We do have public comment from the phone. Susan Lauren, your line is open. Hi. Um, you were talking about health and wellness, which, of course, would be the uh, ob objective for the medical board. Um, and I was in the field of health and wellness. That was my career. I was taken out of my career after 25 years because of a heinous surgical assault. I'm not going to have the opportunity to retire. I was uh, disabled. 
and now I get SSI disability um, that I can't even live on and I'm at risk for homelessness. I hear you talk about these things and I hear, I don't know if you remember the Charlie Brown commercials, uh, uh, cartoons, where the adults would be going wah, 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 because that's what I hear. Because the fact is, health care should prevent and heal, not cause death and injury to healthy people. Adipose removal has negative long-term outcomes. If a doctor says, I've done liposuction for X number of years, and the right candidates love it, and the problem is only with unlicensed practitioners or who, those who don't learn correctly, then that individual does not understand the biology of fat and is minimizing and lying about the dangers. I've watched since 2012 as irresponsible people with medical licenses mislead innocent people online. The medical board is doing nothing about this. Uh, there was a slim woman who posted pictures online. She wanted lipo. Two surgeons privately said no. But a surgeon uh, who's online all the time, he came on and he said, hey, I could get two liters or so from you. He didn't mention that fat is a needed endocrine organ, that there are serious structural and other risks, disturbing long-term fat regrowth, increase in toxic uh, disease-producing visceral fat, or that she may die. The liposuction propaganda doctors spout out negatively affects society's perception of the human body as something that should and can, can be sculpted, and it gives a false sense of safety about board-certified plastic surgeons. Unethical doctors and lawyers team up and keep this bad lipo industry alive, and your board is a player in all of this. There is no honest reason that in the name of consumer protection, you should have let the surgeon who assaulted me continue to practice. A surgeon who reviews cases for your board was hired by the defense in my civil case. He's also among the 10 most wealthy doctors in the world. After doing a poor and incomplete exam, he profited financially by slandering me in line in my trial. I believe your board was biased in my case. I've been asking the state of California to step up in this issue of plastic surgeons doing harmful procedures and covering up for each other as an urgent matter for the health of our citizens. Your doctors are destroying our women, our men too. It affects our children and our communities. So when I hear all of this talk about harm and about health and wellness, it's going in one ear and out the other. We need to step up and do the real thing. I sent my Caller, video to conclude. all of you. I'd like to. I'd like you to raise your hand if you watched that video, and I'd like my activist friends there to tell me later who raised their hands. Raise your Caller, hand if you watched conclude. the video. If every hand didn't go up, then you're not doing your job. And if you watched the video where you see that my gluteus muscles were taken out, Lauren, please conclude. Paperwork, and there's. that I'm considered. Secondly, I want to thank you for honoring Julie D'Angelo Felmus. Um, she's been um, incredible. And um, I think in, probably in the past 14 years, I've been monitoring the board. I've had the opportunity to communicate with her or work alongside with her for the past 12 years. Um, Julie, we've, we've been through quite a bit. Um, ups and downs through some pretty critical consumer protection issues. And I just want to thank you for everything you've done. I hope you enjoy your retirement and um, just a great amount of gratitude for your work and dedication on behalf of consumers of California. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments on the phone? No further comments from the phone at this time. Okay. Moving to agenda item five, board member communications with interested parties. Do any members have anything to report? 
Okay. Are there any public comments from those in the audience? Any comments from those on the phone? No public comment from the phone at this time. Okay. Moving to the next item, which is item six, discussion and possible action on 2020 proposed board meeting dates. Do any members have any questions, <coughs> concerns? Are we okay? We have some, we have to select them, right? So um, if you actually, if you turn to um, tab six on page BRD 6-1, there's a listing of the proposed meeting dates for 2020 there. Um, just to kind of run down it a little bit, the first meeting in 2020, we actually offered three dates. And I know that third date there is an odd date for those that have actually looked it up because it's a Tuesday and Wednesday. Just to let you know why we did that, the following Monday is actually a holiday and we thought that might impact members and attendees if we put it on the 13th and 14th. So we did want to look at that week. Um, just to see if we needed to have a meeting, but there are two other dates. So there's January 30th and 31st there that we could choose, um, or February 6th and 7th. The 6th and 7th date is a difficult one because that's usually our Sacramento meeting, and we did find out that this is one of the problems we always run into in trying to have a Sacramento meeting is that it is the same weekend as that wine festival um, that it ends up pushing our meeting aside because we can't find a place to meet and uh, rooms for the members. So that's an issue with that date, just so you all are aware of it. So we probably wouldn't be able to hold the meeting in Sacramento. Um, if we do move to the 30th and 31st, which is definitely maybe the best option out of them, um, we would have to move the meeting in May up to the 7th and 8th because um, the 14th and 15th would give it too big of a gap for the enforcement um, meeting. So, and then for August 13th and 14th and November 12th and 13th, we just gave that option because that was the best for looking at those enforcement cases. So that's kind of the background on the dates. Okay. So what? What did you? I missed what you said about the 13th and 14th. Um, the the 13th and 14th of August, or the the, the it's that's the date. It's just the best date for the amount of time in between meetings. Well, the only yeah. thing is about the 13th and 14th, and I don't know if I'm the only one here that feels this way, it's in the middle of family vacation. I know it's in the middle of my family vacation. The August 13th and Absolutely. 14th? Yeah, well, we, we do have to have a meeting in August. What and about so, earlier? What about earlier in August? So we could move it up to the weekend, the week before, so it could be the 6th and the 7th. Yeah, that's better, I think. I mean, most people take vacations at the end of August with their family. Uh, I think. Maybe I'm wrong. There's another family. Dr. Krause. Uh, I'm only one board member, so I shouldn't rule today. But, uh, Can I get you to use your microphone, please? Thank you. February 6th to 7th, I already have a commitment to uh, be chairing an international meeting. I am available January 30th to 31st. Um, the other dates are all fine on my own calendar. If we move the August 13th to 14th meeting to the week before, I won't be there because then that's the week of my family vacation. Oh. So uh, I don't know that we'll ever arrive at a, uh, a date that's, uh, that's good for everyone. Um, but uh, I'm not available February 6th to 7th or August 6th to 7th. Christine? I would just like to propose we select the January 30th to 31st yes. date. The 11th to 12th is that right before President's holiday. I think there'll just be a lot of unintended, you know, conflicts for various reasons, um, which then I guess leaves us to select the May 7th through 8th. Um, the 7th through 8th. Mm -hmm. Right, because yeah. you said that's when it comes. And then so everything else then I guess would remain. Uh, the August 13th through 14th, just my opinion about family vacations, um, I love family vacations, but the kids, my kids now start school that week. They've moved up all the, most of the schools have moved up their schedules to start that week now. And so any vacations that I would have would not be that week. <laughs> Sometimes we have had our summer meeting at the last week of July. For, for this um, specific one, because again, we're trying to move those into November so we can make sure that we hit the, um, right fiscal for the statistics we, we would prefer to have a meeting in um, November and if we move the August one up into July it backs everything up 
and because can, of the amount of time in between. Can you just remind me what is the time? I mean, so we're dealing with the enforcement timeline. So what it is is it uh, proposed decisions that are received by the board have to be acted upon within a hundred <coughs> days. Okay. And so that's kind of that fourteen week in between, you know, between the meetings, and so we try to hold it with that. Okay. Is that January 31st, May 7th, and 8th, 8th. Oh. August 13th, 14th? Okay, so. So it sounds like kind of August 30 to 30, I mean, January 30th to 31st would be the best for those individuals. Um, May 7th and 8th, and I know uh, Ms. Friedman, it might not work for her, but uh, August 13th and 14th, I don't know if there's a split between that and then November 12th and 13th. Does that work okay. for everyone? Okay, I just need a motion then for that. I make a motion, so moved. Okay. okay, thank you. Do we take roll call now? Yeah, I have to ask for public comment. First. Are there any comments from the public? You'll all be thrilled to know that I'm available all those dates. <laughs> At the April meeting last year in Los Angeles, we questioned why you keep having these meetings in expensive hotels with expensive parking. Many paid $40 a day to park at this hotel last year. Today I found a lot next door that was cheaper, but we have disabled consumers who sometimes come to these meetings who can't park far away to save money. Dev even mentioned the agenda, moved the agenda item at the last meeting in January or last year that uh, where people were in attendance who needed to speak and brought us brought up how expensive the hotel and the parking was. So what did you do this year? You're having it in exactly the same place again. It's like you're purposely doing it in hope of keeping consumers away. Carrie and I already uh, talked about some. Uh, hotels in the past, I questioned her years ago about how, why the meetings are never held in Burbank, where there's a convenient airport with a hotel and meeting rooms right across the street and lots of reasonable adjacent restaurants. She hemmed and hawed with some drivel, but it, it too became an out of sight, out of mind issue. It is my understanding that these meetings are held regionally, at least in part to accommodate consumers all over the state so that they can attend the meetings as well. But the places you're choosing, regardless of the city itself, is prohibitive to many. You complain about not having enough money to pay employees and the DAGs and the experts, and yet you indulge yourselves in these expensive hotels. Who is the one making the decisions on these hotels? I would like to request that the board members work to make these meetings more affordable for consumers to attend and to save money for more important things like paying the people actually tasked with doing the investigations better instead. Your focus should be on what's best for consumers, not vanity hotels to make the board comfortable. It's my understanding that the hotel picked for San Diego is also very expensive. I think Marion Hollingsworth can speak on that since she lives down there. I looked up all the meeting locations since 2007 and only three times has it been outside of one of the normal areas, one in Long Beach, one in Riverside, and one in Santa Ana. A news article from 2005 mentioned one being in Burbank. What about the people in the rest of the state? Why not Palm Springs instead of San Diego? Why not Fresno instead of Sacramento? Why not Redding instead of San Francisco? Again, this shouldn't only be about what's convenient for all of you. Thank you. Are there any other comments? I think I filled out a slip already. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was for six? All right, thank you. Oh, okay, that's all right. Good afternoon. My name is Marion Hollingsworth, and I'd also like to comment on the uh, location of the meetings. Uh, have you ever considered how expensive it is for most members of the public to attend? Most working people don't want to sacrifice a day's work to go to a meeting. It would be helpful if one of the meeting days, even once or twice a year, be at night, like 6 to 10 p.m. or on a Saturday, when more people could attend without missing a day's work. And to echo what uh, Mr. Andrus said, also the pricey hotels you choose for the meetings are a deterrent to most people who may have to travel and spend the night. For example, the Westin in San Diego, where you'll have your fall meeting, is about is in excess, actually, of $300 per night. And parking, the last time I checked, was $42 a day. Uh, all of their parking downtown is valet, and Westin has no public parking in the downtown area. So with CHIP, that makes parking alone $100 for a two-day meeting. Last fall, though, you had your San Diego meeting in Kearney Mesa, uh, 
in a hotel there where the parking was free and the rooms are more reasonable. So something like that is, is still, you know, it's still a nice hotel, but it's more reasonable for consumers. I hope you will consider being more flexible with times and locations for your future meetings so it's more convenient for the public. And also I'd like to thank Julie for all of her work and dedication to public safety. I have learned so much. I've learned tremendously from you and you've always been so very patient um, and willing to talk to me about all my questions. So thank you so much. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any additional comments in the audience? Any comments on the phone? No comments from the phone at this time. Okay. Ms. Cruz Jones, please perform the roll call. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Ms. Friedman? Aye. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Yes. Dr. Yip? Yes. Ms. Pines? Yes. The meeting dates are confirmed. The next item on the agenda is item seven, the executive management report. Ms. Kirschmeyer. So please find the executive management report under agenda item seven. And there are a few things I would like to bring to the board's attention. Um, I would like to address the comments about the um, hotels and the, the rooms. Um, one thing I do want individuals to understand is the reason that we do pick the venues that we do is because of the difficulty we have in finding a location that's large enough that has two rooms available that has the ability to actually webcast and provide us with another phone line for a teleconference. Um, so that needs to be taken into consideration. We've looked at state buildings. Um, they don't have the um, the venue that we need not only for size but they actually don't have the location that can have a phone line into them um, we've looked at one in Los Angeles that would have the ability for space but it doesn't have the phone lines to where we would actually be use, able to use them for a webcast or for a teleconference sometimes they'll only have one line in we can't get the two that we need and just a lot of the technology is a problem with it and so then we have to look at hotels to attend for them to to be large enough for our group of what we need with our board size. Um, even in Sacramento, the, the meeting room that the Department of Consumer Affairs has, as Mr. Lay knows, the um, dais is not large enough for our um, membership. And so I just wanted to make sure that in my report I address some of those issues. And while I understand a lot of the complexities, um, that is why we're looking at these facilities. And we would actually like to have them even in secure buildings. Um, we've looked at that in the past to where we, you know, there's some type of security with the, the, the building itself. Um, but that's just not something that we've been able to locate within state buildings or other venues. So just wanted to address that. Um, first, regarding the budget, um, as stated at the last meeting, the board has one budget change proposal going through the budget cycle. And I'm happy to report that it has been approved by both the Assembly and the Senate budget subcommittees, and it's just awaiting final legislative approval before me moving to the governor's office as part of the budget bill. And then, as you may remember, what this proposal is, it's actually to increase the hourly rate for the medical experts, as was requested by the board, and also listed in our strategic plan. The other proposals are also moving through the process. One thing about that um, increase in the expert reviewer payment is that the individuals actually will have to take the training, the expert reviewer training, before they get that increased hourly rate. So we think that that's a great um, proposal. Um, there's also a proposal that's moving through, including uh, one to increase the funding for medical consultant hours at the Health Quality Investigation Unit at the Department of Consumer Affairs, and then one to decrease the attorney general line item due to elimination of the vertical enforcement process. And then we also have some budget change proposals that are moving for, through the process also related to the Department of Consumer Affairs, and I'll have more um, next meeting because then the, it will be finalized by that time. In addition, we received uh, information actually from both the Attorney General's Office and the Office of Administrative Hearings that indicates for this fiscal year we're actually going to overspend in those line items. So additional funding has been requested to meet those needs and that's a special process that it has to go through with working with the Department of Consumer Affairs. 
So with these increases, the board will be obtaining a vendor to perform a fee audit this year so we can look at a fee increase next year as we will be at 1.1 months reserve at the end of fiscal year 1920. Regarding staffing, with the departure of Ms. Delt, board staff will be interviewing candidates for the chief of enforcement position within the next month. We hope to have a candidate by the end of June. And in the meantime, we've been very fortunate to have Laura Sweet return to the board as retired a new attempt. Ms. Sweet has brought a wealth of information to the board and is reviewing all investigations and working with staff in the central complaint unit to review its current processes. We've used this opportunity to review the unit and determine where efficiencies can be found and ensure staff have the appropriate tools and resources. Staff have also become involved in this process and as Ms. Pines mentioned, established a work group to look at the board's complaint form and website. One area where Ms. Sweet will be assisting is in the medical consultant program and Ms. Sweet was instrumental actually in building the board's expert reviewer pro training program and we will have her assist with this similar program for the medical consultants in the headquarters office. In addition, she is working to update the medical consultant guidelines. I wanted the members to know that the DCA director, um, Dean Graffillo, has actually left the department. He's gone um, into private industry. We wish him well in his new career and thank him for his service with the Department of Consumer Affairs. A new director hasn't been appointed yet and when that happens, I'll let the members know. In your packet is an update on the licensed physician and dentist Mexico pilot program. And as you will see, the board has finalized the applications and has released those documents for completion by the clinics and physicians. The board has been working with the interested parties to ensure all other requirements for this program are being completed. To date, we have received one clinic ap application and six physician applications. As Ms. Pines mentioned, the Federation of State Medical Board held its annual meeting at the end of April. And one thing that was mentioned um, that is good news for the board is that next year the Federation meeting will actually be in San Diego, which will allow for more members and staff to attend the meeting. The Federation is also hosting a symposium on sexual boundary violations and we have put in for an out of state trip request to be able to attend that meeting. The board has been working with the California Department of Public uh, uh, Health, their statewide opioid safety work group since its inception and a lot of good work has come from the work group. One thing that they have actually done is put together a web page a dashboard where individuals can go and pull statistics regarding opioid deaths and I'd like to point out that on page 7a 14 to 15 is actually a report that was provided from that dashboard and it provides information regarding the different types of deaths and other demographic information I thought might be helpful to the members and also to the public. At the last meeting, I provided information and an update regarding the board's project based upon death certificates where the death was related to opioid prescription drugs. I'd like to provide just a brief update. So there are currently only 28 cases that are still pending an investigation or pending review for closure or transmittal to the Attorney General's office. Um, 281 of those were actually closed due to either no violation, insufficient evidence, or declined to prosecute by the Attorney General's office. Um, 14 of those have actually been closed because a physician was deceased or the license was canceled. We've had three citation and fines issued and 14 have been referred to the AG's office for an accusation or referred to the DA's for criminal action. 45 of them were closed because the physician already had disciplinary action against them due to over prescribing issues or had their license revoked or surrendered. To date, 59 cases have resulting in, resulted in 54 physicians having an accusation filed against them. And of those 54 accusations, seven had had disciplinary action taken against them. One accusation was dismissed and one case resulted in a public letter of reprimand. 20, so this results in 23% of those cases have resulted in an, either an accusation being filed, an accusation pending, or the physician already being disciplined for overprescribing. So once all of the cases have been investigated, the board will look into more specifics on these cases as requested by the members previously. And then lastly, I wanted to point out a new procedure that our information systems branch has implemented. It is outlined in the licensing update, but I wanted to bring it to your attention. And that's that starting in April, they establish a process to send out an email to licensees 180 days prior to their renewal expiration date. And so if those individuals apply prior to 120 days from their renewal date, then it won't require us sending out that paper renewal form um, and then going through the process of it's sent, being sent out for no reason and it, it will be a cost savings to the board of both the process of printing that out and then also mailing that out. On the first day that the email went out to licensees, 500 licensees actually renewed online. So again, it's going to eliminate that cost. 
And then in addition, in the month of April, we actually had 80% of renewals processed online. So that's the largest that we've ever actually had um, since we've gone to the BREEZ system. So staff will continue to look at ways to streamline all of the processes. And this is just one where our technology and our ISB unit has been able to help in this process. So that concludes my report, unless anyone has questions. Any members have questions? No? Okay. Are there any questions from or public comments? Uh, real quick on the meeting room again thing. I just find it hard to believe that these big giant hotels in some of these cities don't have the requirements. If somebody could send me exactly the requirements you need, I'll be happy to call around and find some of these places. I know the city of Los Angeles and the Burbank City Council telecast their meetings and have call-ins, and they have beautiful rooms where they do these from, that they televise them and do webcasting. Um, in 7C, it says calls answered increased from 18,000, blah, 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 to 19,000. But I think that's an irrelevant number if it's just the calls answered by the call system. The relevant number is how many calls are actually handled by a staff member that leads to a beneficial end, and how many people hang up because they have to wait too long for somebody to answer. I also had to laugh when I read that scripts have been created to, for the staff to utilize when assisting callers, and that this will, quote, help the board achieve its strategic goal of improving the quality of customer service, close quote. Who thinks a rank government employee reading a script instead of being taught and knowledgeable about what they're talking about is quality customer service? I, think, I can't think of anything worse than to call in about an, a, an important medical issue and getting somebody who says, just a moment, let me check my script. I don't call that quality. I mean, who wrote that? You can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. I think we'd respect the process more if you were honest and realistic about these things. Don't stop sugarcoating all this stuff in these, in these documents. Thank you. Do we have any other comments? Uh, yes, hello, uh, Dr. E here with uh, Black Patients Matter. So just wanted to reiterate that um, we, do, we do have some concerns, quite a bit of concerns about um, those that are um, in the DCA and um, as far as uh, finding a new chief of informant division, excuse me, enforcement division, we really encourage you to, um, to uh, have diversity, racial and religious diversity, in um, within the uh, enforcement division, uh, because um, as uh, the article that I had submitted supports, um, when the enforcement and investigative divisions of a policing force are not diversified, then it's not too surprising that um, those that they investigate and uh, file accusation against are. Um, so. Um, we just encourage that, and, it's, and it may be out of the hands of the medical board, but um, as far as finding a new director for the DCA, I, I think it may be the governor appoints them, but we, we again encourage um, racial diversity within the DCA. Thank you. Thank you. Marianne Hollingsworth. Hello, my name is Marian Hollingsworth, and I was just wondering, Kim, as far as the, um, on some of the charts you had on the actual number of days it takes to do a complaint, there's a lot of uh, portions from where it's like this part of the investigation or that part. Is there any location we can go to to find the actual total number? Because um, most people, when they look at, at the total time for an investigation, it, um, they look for a total time, and, and is there a way to find that out, or do we need to wait for the um, the annual report for that? Speaking of that, looking at that, okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Are there any um, public comments on the phone? No comments from the phone at this time. Okay, great. Moving to the next item, which is item eight update on the Physician Assistant Board, Mr. Grant and Mr. Sachs. Good afternoon, President Pines, 
medical board members. My name is Robert Sachs. I'm the vice president of the Physician Assistant Board. Accompanying me today is Jed Grant, who is the president of the board and has lost his voice. <laughs> we are here today to give you an update on what the Physician Assistant Board is doing. Our last meeting was on Monday, April 29th, and we discussed the following items. The board staff is growing to meet the demands of regulating nearly 13,000 licensees, and we will be moving into a larger space next year. We have been working on updates to our regulations, including approving language for the regulations that will allow implementation of AB 2138. We wish to move to separate some of the shared services from the medical board. This will be a deliberate process to ensure quality is not lost. Growth of the PA profession in California is increasing in numbers of PA programs. Currently, there are 16 programs in California, half opened within the last five years, and there are five more planning to open in the next one to two years. We also discussed and sometimes took positions on current legislation, most significantly SB 697 by Senator Caviero. And at this point, the board took a position of oppose unless amended. The reasons for that decision were based on to maximize use of physician assistance to increase access to care, allow scope to be determined at the practice level, to remove administrative barriers. Current language is problematic. It adds barriers to prescribing and practice. There is ambiguity in the language. It reduces the ability for the board to regulate. We met with the senator and stakeholders this week. We agreed that we need to move to a regulatory function of the physician assistant board from front end to back end, which would match the current process of the medical board and the board of registered nurses. We hope to see significant amendments in the future so that we can take a support position. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Any questions from the members? Dr. Yip. Thank you. Um, can we in the future have a presentation on the update on the curriculum of teaching PA. I, my understanding, different program, different requirement, different um, subject they uh, need to take, so it's not uniform. And um, we have more and more people entering the workforce at PA. I think we would like a presentation on how do you catch up with all the requirements, standardize it, how do you upkeep on the, uh, the, the like, uh, CME, and also this is on the, the percent of uh, PA that uh, have come pre brought against them and the percent of, uh, um, uh, just like the medical board, the uh, company being looked into and what the outcomes to. Because they're, they're a huge workforce out there that taking, taking care of our patients as a first line uh, provider. Thank you. I apologize. My hearing aids are not working in this large room, so I'm going to let Mr. Grant try to answer the question. I was, I'm sorry about my voice. I really don't have a voice. Um, I couldn't understand. Uh, I was having trouble hearing also. Could you repeat the question? No, actually it's not a question, it's a suggestion that in the future, if the board can give a presentation on the uniformity of the application to be a PA, the curriculum in all the school, as you have like 16 and five and more, um, from my own experience, my MA that applied to uh, PA school, they take, take different curriculum classes. And I think the main thing is that how are they trained to be competent as they're being a major force in the first line healthcare provider in California. And what is the complaint process? Are they like doctor that the signs say, you know, if I have a problem, I'm a PA, you can call this number and complain about me. And what is the statistic on the discipline and what is the outcomes? Thank you. Uh, we can certainly come back and do a presentation uh, on our process for that. I can briefly answer your question about accreditation. There's 265 PA programs in the United States. They're accredited by the Accreditation Commission for Physician Assistant Education. There's only one accrediting body in the country. And all PA programs 
are accredited by that accrediting body, and therefore the curriculum for PA programs looks fairly similar. It's about three academic years uh, modeled after medical school where the first year is all didactic, and the second and third years are clinical, much like clerkships. Um, they're, they're all graduate degrees, but if uh, we can maybe put on a future agenda and come back and give you a more formal presentation on PA education and our process at the PA board for how we uh, license and regulate. Are there any additional questions or comments from members? Okay. Um, so I have a lot of people that want to speak. Just one. Oh. oh, I take that back. <laughs> Okay, there's only one person. Um, Gay Bryman. Hi, thank you very much. I'm Gay Bryman. I also have a voice problem, sorry. Um, I'm with the California Academy of PAs, and I'm going to speak later to 697. But right now, I'd just like to share a little bit about PA history that you may not know. In the mid-1960s, Dr. Eugene Stead created the first PA training program at Duke University. It was in response to a physician shortage, but also it took into consideration the growing number of medics returning from tours in Vietnam. PA SAC is one of those. Um, thank you. Um, the first graduates from PA programs were veterans. And PAs are and still are trained in uh, the medical model with physicians. About 10 years after that, California passed enabling legislation for PAs and promulgated le regulations. This was a brand new profession. No one really knew what was going to happen to it. PAs weren't steeped in nursing roots like the NPs were when they were developed. PA practice in healthcare has changed substantially over the last 44 years. For instance, those first PAs, when they saw a patient, they had to have a form signed prior to seeing the patient. The form was called the permission to be seen by and be treated by a PA. Um, the mindset at the time was that we had to protect consumers from this new experimental profession. No one really knew what PAs could do. They didn't know how PAs were trained. And maybe restrictive barriers were necessary at that time. However, 54 years after Dr. Sed saw the benefit of PAs to physicians in the healthcare system. PAs have proven to be safe, they're highly educated, they're highly respected, and they're now a profession all of their own in their own right. It's time for PAs to be regulated like all other healthcare professionals. Restrictive and unnecessary barriers for PAs must be broken down in order for PAs to provide care in all medical settings. PAs always work in physician-led teams with physicians. PAs do not seek independent practice. SB 697, which I'll talk about later, um, will move the PA Practice Act into the 21st century. 50 years of excellent patient care, high regard from the physician community, high regard from um, the healthcare system in general, and the fact that PAs always work with physicians, with the physician at the lead, I think it's time that the experiment is over. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments from the audience? Any comments on the phone? No comments from the phone at this time. Okay. Moving to the next item, which is item nine, discussion and possible action on legislation and regulations. Ms. Simones. Hello, good afternoon. So um, please refer to your legislative packets in the tracker list. On your tracker list, the bills in blue are two-year bills, and the bill in orange, the board already took a position on it. So these bills do not need to be discussed at this time. The bill in pink is the board's sponsor bill, so we will go over this bill first, and the bills in green will require discussion and a position. Before I move on to the sponsor bill, I just wanted to provide a quick update on the board's legislative day. It will be held next week on May 15th, and staff has set up 17 meetings to meet with legislators and our staff and we'll provide another update the next board meeting after our ledge day. So moving on to the sponsor bill update, SB 786, this is the committee's, um, they call it omnibus or committee bill, and it includes all the 
proposals basically from boards that are technical and clarifying in nature and have no opposition. Um, so the board ha has a couple um, changes in there. It's to clean up existing code um, for 803.1 and to also delete some codes that um, are just basically outdated. And so that was put in SB 786. It's moving along through the process. Um, and I'll move on to the next bill unless someone, any questions. Okay, so the first bill in green, which is AB 241, this bill would require beginning January 1st, 2022, all continuing medical education courses for physicians to contain curriculum that includes the understanding of implicit bias and the promotion of bias reducing strategies to address how unintended biases in decision making may contribute to health disparities by shaping behavior and producing differences in medical treatment along lines of race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, or other characteristics. The board believes that implicit bias training is important and requires it for all its employees and other individuals that are involved in the board's enforcement process. Requiring CME for physicians to include information on implicit bias could help to reduce health disparities, which would further the board's mission of consumer protection. As such, board staff recommends that the board support this bill, but I would need a motion. Second. Are there any question, comments or questions from the members? Dr. Krause? I'm always a little bit nervous when the legislature wants to prescribe CME. Uh, I'm reminded of what happened when 12 hours of pain management CME were required uh, and the lecturers that were giving discussions around the state on pain management turned out to be well-paid consultants of Purdue Pharma mm. who told us that we had to treat all pain. Implicit bias is rampant. It always has been, uh, and we're just beginning to face it in the nation and in the state, uh, and it's a very important thing to recognize and to fight against in the practice of medicine. But one, I'm uncertain that a legislative act is the appropriate way to do that and two, I'm concerned about the language in this bill where it requires that all continuing medical education have some inclusion and in curriculum in relation to implicit bias. Some of my CME credits are based on one hour meetings at the hospital or at the university on specific topics and it's hard to create an artifice to put implicit bias training into every CME course. On the other hand, when CME was required by the state for cultural and linguistic competency, which was part of this law which is being amended, the proscription was that associations that accredit continuing medical education shall develop standards. And I think similarly, it would be better for this bill to require those associations that develop CME programs to find ways of including implicit bias in their programs rather than for the law to state specifically that all CME uh, must include implicit bias training. So that is actually the intent. So they did base it on the cultural linguistic competency law. This bill started out actually putting like a testing requirement for physician CME at a particular hour, like an eight hour um, requirement. Um, and we did do some technical suggestions that they base it on the cultural linguistic competency requirements. That's how we are anticipating that this will get um, implemented, that it will be similar to the cultural linguistic competency that we will let those um, accreditation agencies that accredit CME know that this is a requirement so they'll be looking for it in CME so we don't see it as like a, a particular mandate on required CME but just making sure just like cultural linguistic competency that it's kind of woven into the CME and then so when they're approving that category one CME that they will look to make sure that those elements are in there so that's what the intent is and it's come a long way from its introduction um, and you know at the author staff has been very um, been very eager to make you know make these amendments and working with assembly BMP staff and that's kind of where the current state where the bill is and that what you, you said Dr. Krauss that is the intent good because in all fairness the the copy of the bill I was reading is dated January 18th so okay perhaps that has been revised but uh, yeah, it, I'm certainly I'm a... certainly in support of the concept okay uh, but sometimes the devil is in the details okay great mm -hmm. are there any additional Dr. De yeah, uh, Jennifer, I think I had the same concerns. I don't even know how you can put into 
every CME program, but if it is the CME people who are putting the CMEs out, they were the ones who are responsible, I'm okay with it too. Because many scientific CMEs I take, there is nothing about uh, uh, even cultural competency doesn't come into play. It's all about uh, some uh, biochemical reaction, what, what your answer is. That, that's the way some of these programs are. So uh, putting it on the top of the CME providers, I don't have an objection, but I think if you ask every program to have one, it's almost impossible to manage uh, whatever, I, whatever we do, educational programs uh, in the hospital. Some of them are easy, because if it is population health, it's pretty simple. But some scientific stuff, you can't do it. Uh, it was pointed out to me that, although it says January 18th on the body of the bill, that, that what was reproduced for us is amended in assembly April 30th, right. where it still says all. So I would prefer that we take a support if amended position okay. where it would follow the same type of proscriptive recommendation that's in the language for cultural and linguistic competency rather than require that every CME credit include implicit bias training. I believe that's the intent, so. Where's that? She, he's showing you. She's showing you. Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Bullock. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think one of the issues that comes to mind is the scientific research. And scientific research omits people of color often mm -hmm. um, because the PI doesn't have enough of a RA uh, support to provide um, surveys in other languages. And so, and I do hear my colleagues on the board, their concerns of all, because if I were doing a P&T committee and talking of, of, of pharmacy and therapeutics committee in a hospital, and we were talking about drug X, one might make that argument. On the other hand, as we move towards genomics and precision medicine, we do know that mm -hmm. those things make a difference. Unfortunately, we haven't studied it well enough. And finally, implicit bias, it's raising the consciousness. And if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. But if it does, then let's add it to the, um, to the curriculum. Any other comments from members? Do we have anything on this? Any comments from the public? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Ree here with uh, Black Patients Matter. So, of course, uh, we definitely um, agree with uh, several of the comments um, from the board members. Um, and of course, implicit bias training um, is a step in the conceptually is a step in the right direction. However, um, to be trained in implicit bias is one thing, but to continue to have and practice with implicit bias is another thing. So again, um, as far as utilizing, a, a good start would be as far as utilizing medical experts um, with the medical board, it would be um, probably more relevant to have uh, medical experts who maintain a medical practice where at least, let's say, 50% of their patient population is racially diverse. Um, so that, that would be a, a wonderful step um, in addressing uh, patient bias, racial bias. And we also, Black Patients Matter, would also like to thank uh, Ms. Wright here for her um, diligence and her um, um, presence on the medical board and her hard work at um, addressing patient care. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other comments from the public? Do we have any comments on the phone? No comments from the phone at this time. So I want to come back to that we have a motion and then we've had a comment to make an amendment. And do we want to move forward with the current motion or an amendment? And I also hear it with Dr. Bolat. So I think about um, maternal care and I think about the increased death of African American women and Hispanic women during maternal care. And if we were, if I was a doctor, and then I'm pretending to really understand 
um, how CMA courses would really work. But perhaps if in one of those CMA courses around C-section that I had a, some insert of implicit bias around that procedure as it relates to women of color, that perhaps I would um, monitor them so that what tends to happen, which is the hemorrhaging, would be caught early and we wouldn't have a, you know, a disastrous outcome. So I hear what you're saying, Dr. Krause, but if we're really going to change people's perceptions, we almost have to put it in front of them consistently. And that's all I want to say about that. I just want to, so if you look at page uh, AB 2241-5, and you look at section B1 there at the bottom of the page, that language is exactly what the language is if you look over. Um, so that's, that's for the culture and linguistic, that it has to have that part of competency in the practice of medicine. Then when you turn over to 2421-7, uh, and you look at D, it's the same language. It, and that's the section that applies to us. The next session that goes into talking about regulations and everything, that's not our section of law. So the only one that applies to us is D on that page. So you're looking at line eight if you're going on the line notes on the side. So it's on or after January 1st, 2022, all continuing medical education courses shall contain curriculum that includes the understanding of implicit bias and the promotion of bias, reducing strategies, et cetera. Um, that is exactly the same language that we use for cultural and linguistic competency. So it is the same language that we currently have for those. I had uh, taken the alls, which are italicized throughout. So that isn't our section. So you see that next section, the 273.6.5 that starts on line 33, that isn't our section of law. That's another board. And that, that's because we did suggest that they base it on. So I think it's just verbatim what. It's yeah. verbatim, right. yes. So if, if you want it to look like what the culture and linguistic is, it does. Okay, because I'm, I'm impressed that it reads in the old language, associations that accredit continuing medical education courses shall develop standards for compliance with the requirements. Um, whereas the language that I'm reading is that all CME has to include implicit bias training. And it all also has to do culture and linguistic. It's just up to the associations that approve that CME to make sure that it has that. And the, we don't approve our own CME courses. Right. The, um, we have four different entities, four, three, um, four different entities that can approve um, CME and approve those courses. So I think it's the, is it different, Carrie? Am I wrong? There, there are differences because there are subdivisions under the cultural linguistic competency that have caveats in there. Okay. So for example, currently when I take a CME course, I have to check a box, culture and linguistic topics were covered. And sometimes I check no, right. because it's not part of every CME course, but that doesn't mean that the CME credit is void. So, so perhaps it just requires a discussion with the author to be sure that we don't end up with something that's unintended? That discussion happened, so that's their intent. So if we need more amendments, then I'm sure that they'd be happy to take them because that's what they're basing it on is the cultural linguistic competency. That that was the idea behind that, and that's what, you know, working with Assembly BMP, they took that as a committee amendment, but that was the intent, so. And, and I think it would still meet your all's concern that it would be in the, the relevant ones, so. But you still do have just a, a motion on the table that's only support. So if you want to change it to support, if amended, to make it look exactly like the cultural and linguistic, then we would have to have an um, amendment to the motion. But Ms. Moses already had these conversations with the author, correct? Mm -hmm. So if there's an amendment that we think is needed, what I'm saying is I'm sure that, you know, I'd have to work with the author's office. I can't speak on their behalf, but they've been open to taking amendments in the past. Um, Dr. Warm, I mean, Mr. Warmworth. <laughs> we seem to be talking about whether or not uh, a a one hour or a a short CME, uh, it whether it's appropriate 
to bring this subject up, uh, in my opinion, regardless of how much it, how long that is, it's always worthwhile to bring up uh, this problem and talk about mitigation of it. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, we have to have 30 minutes uh, out of a one hour credit being mm -hmm. on this. Mm -hmm. It's that we should always be talking about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ms. Wright. Please use your mic. Class, there will be a, a brief anecdote or discussion that references implicit bias, sort of like the maternal health care, because maybe that's where we're getting caught up. Because I didn't see this as every single class all the time. I saw it as a certain subject, and then implicit bias was referenced therein. I think the intent was that in implicit bias, just like cultural linguistic competency, we woven into existing CME. And when the accreditors accredit CME as category one, that they look for that to make sure it's woven in. If we need some amendments to make it clearer for that, but I believe that was the intent. Because before, like I mentioned, they actually had that you had to have a certain number of hours, right? You had to have to take a test on it. And they did take those amendments um, to try to make it more like cultural linguistic competency. So I don't, they're not prescribing how much of that course has to be implicit bias. It's just that it's woven in. Because for reference, this sounds less less restrictive than the state bar, which requires me one hour of a certain thing. This is woven in, which makes sense, because I think it's important, mm -hmm. especially for Ms. Pine's reference to maternal health care. This is a big deal, and it, mm -hmm. it should be referenced. And I, I second and echo Mr. Warmoff's comments. I think it should always be included, mm -hmm. whether it be black, Latino, LGBTQIA, I mean, all of it should be included. So I think I made the motion. So I'm, I'm not going to accept an amendment at this time. So let's just see what happens when we take the vote. Dr. Gananadev? Yeah, just a question for uh, uh, Jennifer is, uh, why is the uh, Board of Nursing and Nurses Association opposing it? Um, I believe that Board of Nursing, so they actually approve their own CME. So unlike us, where we have uh, people that, you know, accreditors, accreditation agencies that are accredit accreditors that accredit Category 1 CME, BRN actually has the job of approving CME. And so I believe that's why they have issues. But, um, you know, I, I could confirm that with BRN. Um, and CME doesn't apply to nursing. It's CE for them, continuous education. But so I think it's in their section, it's phrased differently, but because each, each section applies to yeah. a different. So the section that's RN is actually that 2736.5. I believe that's RN's code section. So this bill contains both us, okay. BRN, and that's another what? board. Yeah, so I was just talking about the sections that affected us. So. Okay. <coughs> so we have a motion. Do we have a second to the? Second to the Jamie. And just to be clear, the motion is to adopt staff's recommendation. Support. Yes. 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 Staff recommendation. Yes. Any any other comments from the members? Any comments from? We we had comments we already. Oh yeah. Oh, we did. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And we had it from the phone. Yep. Okay. Okay. So now we're ready to for the roll call. Dr. Bolat. Aye. Ms. Friedman. Yes. Dr. Gonadev. Yes. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Kraus. Abstain. Ms. Lawson. Yes. Ms. Lubiano. Yes. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Mr. Warmoth. Aye. Ms. Wright. Yes. Dr. Yip. Aye. Ms. Pines. Yes. Okay. Next. I thought that was going to be an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> so, All Jennifer, right. we, we, we are relying on you to really follow through, make sure that it is like cultural competency. Okay, but we have a support position. Okay, got it. 
Okay, the next bill, AB 387, Gabriel, would require a physician to indicate the purpose for a drug or device on the prescription when providing a prescription to a patient unless the patient chooses to opt out of having that purpose on their prescription. Just for some background right now, existing law basically says that a physician can do this, but only if the patient requests it. So right now it's kind of like an opt-in, and this would move it to an opt-out, just to give you some background. So um, it would specify that if the purpose is not indicated on a prescription, a dispensing pharmacist is not re responsible for ascertaining the purpose or determining whether the patient opted out. It would also require the Board of Pharmacy to adopt re revised regulations to provide technical guidance regarding the manner that the um, the, the, the purpose is put on the, the label, and it doesn't become operative until Board of Pharmacy does regulation. So like I said, existing law already allows the purpose to be included on an opt-in basis. This would basically turn into opt-out, so physicians should already and pharmacists should already be able to do this. And it's really the purpose is to um, prevent adverse drug events. And so um, because it's already allowed and it's just changing it like that, um, Staff is recommending that we uh, take a support position on this bill. I so move. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Do you have any questions from members? Comments? Dr. Hawkins? Uh, briefly, I don't know if you know. It seems like a no brainer. Do you know why these associations are opposed to it? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, I, I have some ideas just maybe because. You know, not everyone wants it required. I, be, I believe some associations are going to be here to, to maybe to speak for themselves. So, <laughs> <laughs> prescription is it as the written one or on the bottle? On and the I, bottle, it's actually on the label. So, hypothetically speaking, I right. mean, Walgreens, somebody I know is behind me. Right. giant reason for why I'm getting right. the prescription. Is it subscript? Is it going to? So what you can do is it allows you to opt out. So you can tell your doctor, I don't want my, the reason on the on the prescription label. Right now, you have to request it. And this would change it from you requesting it to you telling the doctor, I don't want it. And the doctor basically has to tell you that you can't, you know, you can't opt out if you so want. So they have to give you a verbal disclosure, hey, you can opt out of this being yes, on your I prescription. So. Let's see okay. <laughs> I'm just yeah, curious. The, yeah, it requires the physician to give the patient the option to opt out. So, okay. yes. Dr. Gananandev? Yeah, uh, how did this even come about? Because it's, it might be even violation of somebody's uh, medical conditions. It worries me, like, uh, just like uh, uh, we heard there, is that uh, it could be HIV. It yeah. could be hepatitis uh, C. Yeah, but the pa the physician has to give has to tell the patient that they can opt out. So it's just changing it from opt in to opt out. And the the physician actually has to tell the patient you can opt out, and then it's the patient's choice. It's not a huge. I mean, it's not a huge change, but of course, it's up to the board. Dr. Lewis, I uh, have concern. A, a label, a prescription label on the label, pill bottle. Not on your pad. The purpose is, I think, believe it's sponsored by the California Senior Legislature. The purpose is they have a lot of prescriptions, and sometimes I don't remember what they're for, and there's adverse drug events, and so that's the purpose behind the bill. Dr. Yip? The way I read this, actually, a physician is the one responsible for putting diagnosis, not your pharmacy. So right. it's still the job for the physician to write on a prescription. I mean, now with electronic prescription, is a lot easier because you can pretty much link the drug to hypertension, et cetera. It's a good thing because sometimes family member look at it and the grandma is taking 15 medicine. But again, I think it's careful. Some of those maybe people with bipolar disorder, depression, that need to protect the privacy. So a little job for physician to do, but it's heading in a good direction. So. Dr. Hawkins? If it appears on the uh, bottle, it's written on the prescription. Right, That's right. so it's both. It's the, the doctor writes on the prescription and then it goes on the I'm bottle. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Any comments or questions or from the public? I think this is a terrible idea. The, 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 the world is moving to a point like with internet stuff when you get spam mail and stuff. Now they're, they're forcing companies to make it so that you don't have to opt out. You have to opt into things. Why would, I, what if a doctor forgets to ask you and it's, it, it ends up on the prescription? I don't think I don't think we should rely on doctors to remember every single time to ask a patient if they're going to want this information on the bottle. I think it should always be an opt-in thing. Hmm. 
Hi, Megan Allred on behalf of the California Medical Association. So we had an opposed position on the version of the bill that you're looking at um, due to a lot of the concerns that have been voiced. Pr serious privacy concerns with the diagnosis being printed on the label. Um, while a diagnosis could be more broad, something about for infection, it could also be much more specific um, to a, a whole host of things that I'm sure you can think of, like HIV or other conditions that maybe someone wouldn't want on there. There were also uh, details that were missing that would have been really impactful, such as what about refills? Is this for every single prescription you have to opt out? Um, if you are electronically prescribed this or if you email your doctor and say, I have these symptoms, can you send something in? They send it to the pharmacy. You're not given a chance to opt out at that point. Uh, so with this version of the bill, we are opposed. We've worked extensively with the author's office, are looking at amendments that might change the bill uh, to be, to have a little more autonomy as to the prescribing to make the EHR systems do this, to have the physician offer this, um, but to this version of the bill, we are opposed. Oh, Dr. Gananadev. Oh. I, I just think this is one more thing that drives doctors over the edge about filling out paperwork. This is just one more thing. If you write on that label, you know, take this pill two times a day for three weeks, and then, st I mean, by that time, you've run out of space. So I'm against it because I think it's really another thing to drive doctors over the edge. Um, if I'm understanding Jennifer from you correctly, this is all about consumer protection and making sure that the person ingesting whatever prescription has information mm -hmm. about why they're taking it, right? So that they can make good decisions. I mean, that's the purpose of the bill. I mean, I think we have to remember this is already allowed if a patient requests it. So we're moving it from opt in, like, I'm a patient, I would like this to a doctor including it and saying to the patient, are you sure sure you don't want to opt out? So we're moving from opt in to opt out. So, I mean, it's up to you guys. What so, you do. I mean, I, I think we should for. keep in mind our consumer protection function mm -hmm. and that that is the intent behind the legislation. The devil, of course, um, I'm an attorney, the devil's always in the details about how these things get get written. Um, and so I would just urge you to, I would urge us to support this because I think that the intent um, is to make sure consumers have more information mm -hmm. rather than less. But I would urge us to continue to monitor this um, and make sure that the language is right so that we have privacy interests, um, that those interests are also paramount. Dr. Gananadev? In the current form of the bill, I oppose it because of the, say, the privacy issues. I think it's a serious problem. Uh, even if I take some medications, it's not on my bottle. It just makes no sense to me. If I want it on my bottle, I can ask the doctor to put it on. I, I think it's just a bad idea unless they come up with some amendments which makes protects the consumer like uh, uh, we heard here. But just the way it is, I, I think uh, we are, uh, everybody in the family looks at the bottle. Everybody who comes to the house looks at the bottle because they're there. It's looking at there, it says, Hep C. Oh, come on, is that what uh, uh, one of your uh, friends or relatives coming to see it on the bottle? It makes no sense to me. <laughs> Many times you take them, you oh, don't Dr. Hawkins. I, I, I appreciate the legitimate privacy concerns, but I think what they're, uh, and, and I think it needs to be a balance. We need, they need to figure out how to protect legitimate privacy concerns. But my understanding, again, is that the intent behind this legislation is to make sure that people are making safe decisions when they ingest pharmaceuticals. So, um, and, I, and I don't think that's a bad thing, frankly. Dr. Hawkins? So I've heard everything, including the privacy issues, and I practice about 12 hours a day. And more often than not, a patient will ask me, what is this for again? Rather, and occasionally I have someone who say, we've already decided, well, I don't want that HIV on there. They may see immune deficiency or infection. They know what it's for. And so I think this is a good idea. Um, and I don't, I think the, Privacy issue, in my opinion, is less of a problem than the patient education and safety issue. Yeah. Dr. Krauss? The good thing about having more laws that set more requirements for physicians 
is we'll increase the business of the medical board because we'll receive more complaints. <laughs> Are there any other comments? Uh, Mr. Walmart? Uh, I'm old and I'm fat. I take a lot of medications. Uh, I couldn't tell you offhand what medication is taken for what problem. Mm. I think that it particularly when you're talking about a population that might have uh, memory problems, mm -hmm. asking them to remember to opt out is not a good choice. So, I mean, I guess an option could be support the concept because <laughs> it feels like we're a little divided on this subject. I don't leave it up to you guys, but. So you could support the concept of the opt out with that, and then we could be direct, you could direct staff to go back and look at some of the issues of what have been brought forward with, you know, the electric electronic medical record and you know refills and things like that um, and we could look into that do we have a motion yes your motion we just support okay it's been the second right yes. okay any other questions comments from members oh, dr bola sorry i'm just trying to process the mm -hmm. opt in and opt out opt in and opt out and i think that's that for me, that's the part that's a little bit sticking. So can you, Jennifer, one more time? Oh, sure. Oh, so right, right now it's opt-in. So that means if I am a patient, I have to go to my physician and say, I would like the purpose um, on the label. And that can happen right now. That's it can right. be printed out that way. Now it's going to basically be automatically put on that label unless the patient says, I do not want the purpose on the label. And the bill requires the physician to remind the patient that they have the ability to opt out. So that's so now for it's opt in. So that's for me is kind of a little bit of a sticking point. The opt it, because I am a thousand percent behind having the training and education, and in fact, that's how we train our residents. Right. You know, you the average person leaves the hospital with fifteen medications, and by the way, it prints on the after visit summaries, and we tell our doctors you need to tell the patient what they're taking and why they're taking it, and so on and so forth. So for me, it's the my, my sticking point is the opt out, which is the whole purpose of the bill. Because if the bill weren't to be in print, we already have opt in. I mean, that's existing yeah, okay. law. So the whole purpose of the bill is the opt out. So it's hard to make ask for an amendment that go back to existing right, law, right? So it sounds like the, there are some amendments being worked on right now, and unfortunately, we can't talk about those right now because that's not in print, and we don't know exactly what they are, but. If we took a support and concept position that, you know, we could support the concept of it and then work it out because it doesn't sound like we're going to get to, unless we do a couple votes to see which one wins. I'm not sure where. One more, one more, we could opt out. One, one more point, and maybe one of the things, if, if we went with this, the, that some of the issues that I, we've heard is those, let's say, sensitive conditions. There may be those types of things that may be for an STI treatment. You know, you don't want to write chlamydia, right? right. And, and this happens, right. right? It does happen now where people say, hey, I went to the pharmacy and I see this on here and so on and so forth. So if there was a way that we could, the author could talk about sensitive conditions that those would be the ones that might be amended out of there because I could understand where some of those things could be for your prep and pep and all of that. Dr. Gananadev? Yeah, just uh, uh, let me ask you, Jennifer, can we just stay neutral on this one for now and see what I mean, the amendments We don't have to even do? take a position if you don't want to. <laughs> right, on this I mean, one, that's I mean, what, <laughs> because it's still not fully cooked. It's mm, being right. done. Yeah, but I mean, like, neutral kind of means like we don't care either way, so I don't know if that's appropriate for this bill, because obviously there's kind of arguments on both sides. Can we take, uh, uh, but can we not take a position on this bill? We don't have to take, I mean, that's up to the board. We don't have to take a position. It sounds like, you know, the problem is our next board meeting, it's kind of like, mm, session's almost over, so. Um. Doc, Dr. Hawkins? I believe we should take a position and it should not be neutral. It takes another extra second to write hypertension, diabetes, an abbreviation. And the average doctor is smart enough to know not to put chlamydia, to put infection. And the patient knows what it's for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I haven't made a comment. But when I think about um, stats of 
um, the aging population and how more people are living longer, um, which means if more people are living longer, most likely they're taking drugs to live longer. Um, and so we're going to have a larger group of people who will be on prescription drugs. And the more they know about what they are, in fact, taking, I think the safer they'll take those drugs mm -hmm. um, and not even just decide, well, I'm not going to take those pills. I mean, my father is on 14 pills, and sometimes he decides he's not going to take something. Mm -hmm. um, and if he knew, like, that was the one he really needed to take. Um, so I, I'm in support of it. Any other, oh, Dr. Yip? I'm a physician. I don't mind doing more work to support it. Just a word of advice to work with the pharmacy board also because they are the one making phone call to me and say, did you write this? Do you want this on? So I think we need to work on logistics, um, how to opt in, opt out too. So. Okay. so we have a motion on the table to support. Are we in a second to that? If you Before things, I go to the... Wait a minute. If you want things left alone, you vote no. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. No. If, yes. If you vote to support the bill, you're supporting the opt-out version of what the bill is right now. Okay. If you want it to stay exactly the way it is right now, you're going to vote no. Got it. On the support. <laughs> okay. Any any more members? Any comments? Okay. Um, any comments from the public? in the audience. Any comments on the phone? We have no comments from the phone at this time. Okay. Ms. Cruz-Jones, please call the roll. Dr. Bolot? Aye. Ms. Friedman? No. Dr. Gonadev? No. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Opt out, which is abstain. <laughs> Ms. Lawson? Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? No. Mr. Warmuth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Abstain. Dr. Yip? <laughs> Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. That's six eyes. Six, three, and two. I don't understand. What's the vote? Three so names. It moves forward. It passes. Next. It's going to be a long night. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next bill, AB 407 would allow a physician or a doctor of podiatric medicine to, to provide fluoroscopy services without a fluoroscopy permit or certification if the services are provided in a setting that is in compliance with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services conditions for coverage relating to radiation safety. As of January 1, 2019, all fluoroscopy operators working in facilities accredited by the Joint Commission are now required to undergo radiation safety training to maintain their privileges. This on-site training will be provided on an annual basis and surveyed by the accrediting agency. And unless the laws change, this will be in addition to the required exam that's already re already currently required. So due to the new radiation safety training required, it seems reasonable to no longer require physicians and doctors of podiatric medicine to obtain a fluoroscopy permit or certification. And as you probably know, that's the one that you have to obtain from Department of Public Health currently. And so board staff is recommending the board take a neutral position on this bill. Dr. Kananavde? I would support that. It's what they're doing with this, with this, for this license is just uh, unbelievable for people who occasionally use a fluoroscopy. It makes no sense what, uh, what, they re what the requirements newer ones are. We have a motion? Is that a motion? Yeah, is that a motion? Uh, yes. Okay. Can motion I Motion to, for a neutral push. Second. Second. Okay. Any questions, comments? From the members? Any comments in the audience? Any comments on the phone? No public comment at this time. Okay, Ms. Cruz Jones? Dr. Bola? Aye. Ms. Friedman? Aye. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. 
Dr. Kraus? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Warmuth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Yes. Dr. Yip? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Okay, next bill, AB 528. It would change the time frame for dispensers to report dispense prescriptions to the cure system from seven days to the following working day. Reducing the reporting deadline will result in up-to-date information and cures and make it even more of an effective aid for physicians to use to prevent doctor shopping. This provision was also included in AB 1752 from last year, which the board supported. So as such, board staff is recommending that the board support this bill. Need a motion. Can I get a motion? Dr. Hawkins? I just had a, uh, a question first. Mm -hmm. So a question, I wonder what the pharmacist think about this. I, I've used cures like I'm supposed to and it's very, very helpful, but a one day versus um, a week or something like that, can they actually do that? What do the pharmacists say about the ability to actually do this? So I'm not sure, 100% sure of what all of the pharmacists um, think about it, but I know that there's a lot of talk out there right now about whether they can actually do it. I think those that have the electronic, um, all of their elect their records are electronic and everything. I don't think it's a problem to put it in, but some of the other entities might have some some issues with it. I know for the pharmacy board, they definitely support it. Right. Um, that's a, that's my only question about it. Reservation is where they can actually do it, or whether it's going to be a bottleneck. Patients can't get the prescription; they can't because they're filling all these prescriptions in certain communities, uh, updating cures. Yeah. Okay. Can I get a motion to oh, Dr. Kananadev? Yeah. I so move to my support. Second. Okay, second. Are there any other questions from members, comments? Any comments from the public? Any comments from the public online? Any comments? No questions from the public on the line. Okay, Ms. Cruz-Jones, please call roll. Dr. Bolad? Aye. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Kraus? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Warmuth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Yes. Ms. Dr. Yip? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Okay, next bill, AB 544 would limit the maximum fee for the renewal of a license and inactive status to no more than 50% of the renewal fee for an active license. This bill would prohibit a board from requiring payment of accrued and unpaid renewal fees as a condition of reinstating an expired license or registration. So the board does not currently have a status for physicians that would allow them to pay, pay a reduced licensing fee to hold their license if they decide to stop practicing for a period of time or if they move to another state except for retired status. The board currently charges the full renewal fee for inactive licenses. To provide a lower cost option for physicians who do not practice for a period of time or move to another state, it may be more reasonable to only charge a 50% renewal fee for inactive licenses. However, if a physician is delinquent on their renewal fees for years, they should be required to pay those fees before they can renew their license. To be more reasonable to physicians who are out of practice for a period of time, board staff recommends that the board take an opposed unless amended position on this bill. The amendments would be to keep the 50% renewal fee for inactive status licenses, but to delete the provisions that do not allow the board to charge accrued fees for licenses that, that are delinquent. This will incentivize physicians to put their license in an active status if they decide not to practice in California for a period of time. So I need a motion. So Second. Just a question for you. Sure. So somebody can take inactive and just pay only half license fee? Is that so that's what this bill is proposing. So right now, um, basically they're looking for a way for physicians um, to in, be incentivized to stay in California but not require these big fees. If, they're, if there's some reason like, you know, they take some years off to take care of their children or if they move to another state, there's really no option right now. An active license, we full, charge the full renewal fee um, even if they're not practicing. Um, so this bill basically does it a couple of ways. It says, you know, we can only charge half for the inactive license fee. And if they're delinquent, let's say they're delinquent on their fees for several years, it basically says we can't charge them any delinquent fees. So what we're saying, I guess, is maybe as an option is to allow allow those physicians to only pay half if their license is an active, license, an active status, but 
but we don't think it's a good idea to not allow us to charge any delinquent fees. If they're delinquent, they should have to pay their fees before they, um, they renew their license. Uh, for Kim, do we have any idea what uh, revenue loss for the medical board will yeah, be? Yeah, it's actually the in the analysis um, under the fiscal portion. Um, so yes, right okay. now, um, it would result in a revenue loss of 261000 per year for the board. This is based on, um, so the loss for the... Um, the loss for the inactive would be 96,000 and the accrued delinquent fees would be 165,000. And so it would be basically if we move forward with what it is, it would half that um, 96,000, it would uh, be 48,000 for just the inactive, but we'll be able to keep that 165,000 the way we're making an amendment. Or so recommending an just amendment. beyond this bill, let me ask you something. So, if somebody is practicing in New York, has a California license, has no intent of coming uh, uh, to California, can they? What can they do to that license, and can they reapply when they want to come? So, these uh, these are the questions I get asked all the time, and I don't even know what the answer is. So, the answer is they can put their license into inactive status, okay. but they have to pay the full licensing fee every year. They can put it into retired status, even though they may not be retired, and they don't have to pay a licensing fee, and they don't have to um, pay a, um, they wouldn't have to pay anything if they come back. All they'd have to do is come back and take it out of retired status and pay that one fee to come out of retired status. Um, they do have to, and they don't have to take CME in that retired status. And then the other thing that happens is they could just let it go delinquent if they let it go delinquent, if they hit five years, it cancels and they have to reapply for a license through the whole application process again and meet the requirements of today. And so if they are a um, individual in that status, though, if they renew on, you know, four years and eight months, then they have to pay all of those accrual fees to bring them to be able to practice. So those are their options that they have right now. I don't think I've missed any um, any statuses, but that, those are the options. That's why we're saying you're, there really isn't an option for an individual to put it into a low cost holding pattern while they may be out of state and if they're planning on coming back. That's why we recommended this bill has that good potential. It will take it down to 50%, so it will incentivize them to go into an inactive status, and then if they want to come back, then they can pay the full amount and come back into practice without us losing all of those accrual fees, because if an individual's delinquent, they should have to pay their fees. What are Dr. Krause? of the other 40 BCA boards on this inactive status? Uh, so I don't know all boards. I know when we when we got this bill, um, it, it hadn't been discussed, and so I actually reached out to several of the other executive officers. Other boards are actually having even a larger hit to their revenue by this bill, and a lot of them are just actually opposing it. And they, because they have may have an inactive in, like ours where they can charge the full amount. Some of them actually have a half fee. Um, but it seems like everybody was going to oppose this bill. I don't know if anybody else that's doing kind of what we're doing to date. I haven't heard any right, Jennifer. Everybody seems to be opposing. Right. And um, I did talk to some committee staff letting them know what we'd be doing. The author's office, they seem open to suggest it taking, you know, possibly d deciding on amends or open to possibly, you know, looking at them at least. And I'm not sure every board actually even has an inactive status, you know, that they use. I know this is in the general BNP, right. so they would have the potential. I just don't know how they're using it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments from members? Any comments from the public? Any comments on the phone? We have no comments from the phone. Okay. Ms. Cruz Jones? Dr. Bolat? Aye. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Abstain. Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Yes. Dr. Yip? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Okay, next bill, AB 613, would authorize boards under the Department of Consumer Affairs to raise their licensing <coughs> fees 
every once every four years by an amount not to exceed the increase in the California Consumer Price Index for the preceding four years with specified limitations. This bill would provide a tool for the board to use in the future to prevent significant fee increases for licensees and allow the board's fund to stay solvent. However, this bill does not prevent the board from pursuing a larger fee increase through statute if needed, and, the, and it only authorizes the board to use this tool. It doesn't require the board to use it. As such, board staff is recommending the board support this bill. Can I get a motion? So moved. Okay. Do we have any questions or comments from members? Any questions from the public? Any comments on the phone? No comments from the phone at this time. Ms. Cruz-Jones? Dr. Bolat? Aye. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Kraus? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Yes. Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Yes. Dr. Yip? Yes. Ms. Pines? Yes. Okay, so AB 714 would, if you all remember AB 2760 passed last year, it re required naloxone to be offered in certain circumstances. There was a lot of implementation issues with that, that bill. The board got a lot of questions. We put together frequently asked questions. This bill is the cleanup bill to that, so we worked closely with the author's office and let them know what kind of questions we were receiving and where there was ambiguities or need for cleanup, and so this is kind of the result of that. So it would clarify that the existing requirement for a prescriber to offer naloxone um, is, is only required when the prescriber is prescribing an opioid or benzodiazepine medication and one of the more one or more of the specified at-risk conditions are present. It would clarify that a concurrent prescription of an opioid and benzo benzodiazepine means that the benzodiazepine medication was dispensed to the patient within the last year. It would clarify that the condition related to increased risk for overdose is related to an opioid overdose before it just said any kind of overdose and that was a big um, area of contention. It would clarify that the requirement to provide education is required when a prescriber is prescribing an opioid or benzodiazepine. And it would provide that a prescriber need not provide the education if the patient declines or has received the education within the past 24 months. It would also exempt prescribers from the requirements when ordering medications to be administered to a patient while the patient is in an inpatient or outpatient setting and when prescribing medications to a terminally ill patient um, as described in existing law specifically for hospice. Um, this bill includes an urgency clause, and it really is needed to clarify the law. It takes care of the issues that the board has received, and I believe the author also worked with other stakeholders, so the board is recommending that the uh, staff is recommending that the board support this bill. Can I get a second? Second. Okay. Any questions or comments from members? Any comments from the public? Any comments on the phone? Any comments on the phone? No comments from the phone at this time. Okay. Ms. Cruz-Jones? Dr. Bolat? Aye. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Kraus? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Yes. Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Same. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Dr. Yip? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Okay, moving on. Next bill, AB 845, would allow for an optional continuing, medicational, continuing medical education course in maternal mental health, which would address best practices and screening for maternal mental health disorders, including cultural competency and unintended bias as a means to build trust with mothers, the range of maternal mental health disorders, the range of evidence-based treatment options, including the importance of allowing a mother to be involved in development and treatment plan, when an obstetrician or primary care doctor should consult with a psychiatrist versus making a referral, and how requirements regarding maternal mental health under existing law. Although the board is historically opposed to mandated CME, this bill would not mandate the CME. It only requires the board to consider this course. It's, that's the wording that's used in a lot of um, CME legislation. If the board decides that it is important to get out information to physicians on this particular type of CME to encourage attendance, it could include an article in its newsletter or put information out on the board's website. So board staff is recommending the board take a neutral position, which is what we've done in the past for other similar optional CME. Dr. Hawkins? So it's an, an important subject. 
But I wonder what the value of making it optional is. I'm not sure what you get out of that. Well, what happens is a lot of times um, people start, that's not the case in this bill, but a lot of times they start with mandated CME, and usually when that happens, there's a lot of opposition, and so they change it. If you look at our code sections, there's a whole you know, sections of all this the board shall consider, and it's basically just to bring attention to it, and we like to help the sponsor, the author, by putting information out on it, but it's not a requirement, so it doesn't bring that kind of opposition. Susan? Well, I just want to say that this is a really important issue, really important. And I think we should do everything we can to make sure that any doctor who has any interaction with any kind of uh, maternity issue is, has to deal with this. <clears throat> any additional questions or comments from members? Any comments from the public? Uh, yes, hello, uh, Dr. Ree here with uh, Black Patients Matter. So it is, it is wonderful to see um, the board addressing, uh, and, and the state, addressing implicit bias. But I do wonder if perhaps in the future we may uh, address explicit bias, in that certainly um, we being human and not robotic yet, uh, that uh, we all come with, um, you know, imperfections and, and biases. So um, uh, my concern is that um, we are actually utilizing medical experts for the medical board who have an explicit bias. And what could that be? Well, uh, how could we guard against that? Um, by utilizing um, medical experts with the board that have a diverse patient population in which they treat. Uh, that would be my suggestion again. Thank you. Are there any other comments <clears throat> in the, are there any comments on the phone? No comments from the phone at this time. Ms. Cruz Jones. Dr. Bolat. Aye. <coughs> Ms. Friedman. Yes. Dr. Ganadev. Aye. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Kraus? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Yes. Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Warmuth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Yes. Dr. Yip? Yes. Ms. Pines? Yes. Okay, moving on. AB 888 Low would expand on the requirements in existing law put in place by SB 1109 from last year and now required a prescriber to have a discussion with any patient, not just minor patients and their parents and guardians, before directly dispensing or issuing the first prescription and a single course of treatment for controlled substances containing an opioid. This bill would exempt patients receiving addiction treatment or hospice care from the requirements. This bill would expand on the, the current required discussion and require the discussion to include the availability of non-pharmacological treatments for pain. After discussing the required information, this bill would require the prescriber to obtain informed written consent from a patient, a, minor's par my, sorry, a minor patient's parent or guardian, or another adult authorized to consent to the minor patient's medical treatment, which be, must be placed in the patient's medical record and contain the name and quantity of the controlled substance being prescribed, the amount of the initial dose, and a statement certifying that the prescriber discuss with the patient the information required by, the, by this bill and have a space for the signature of the patient, their parent or guardian, or, or another adult authorized to consent. This bill would also require the prescriber to offer, as deemed appropriate by the prescriber, a referral for a provider of non-pharmacological treatments for pain. This bill would define non-pharmacological treatments for pain to include, but not be limited to, acupuncture, chiropractic care, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and licensed mental health provider services. This bill would specify that it does not apply if the patient's treatment includes emergency services and care, or if the patient's treatment is associated with or incidental to an emergency surgery, regardless of whether the surgery is performed on an inpatient or outpatient basis or in the prescriber's professional judgment, fulfilling the requirements would be detrimental to the patient's health or safety or in violation to the patient's legal rights. This bill would expand upon a bill from last year which the board supported and require prescribers to discuss important information about the risks associated with, opi with opioids with all patients, not just minor patients. 
So it will also require written conform, informed consent that must be included in the patient's medical records, which will help the board to enforce the bill's requirements. The growing opioid abuse epidemic remains a matter of concern for the board, and this bill will increase education for all patients. So board staff is recommending the board support this bill. Can I get a motion? Do we have any questions or Dr. Gananadev? Yeah, I'm just looking at the people who are sponsoring the bill and people who are supporting the bill and people who are opposing the bill. It, it looks more like a, a scope to get uh, patients into the other areas rather than anything else. I don't know. I, uh, I mean, the, in, the, what you're telling is actually it's a good idea, but as I go through here, I'm not sure this is for one time prescription for acute injury or acute pain, acute, the surgery, pain. emergency surgery you said, but what about That's the exempted and so no, is how about the care. elective surgery? What? Elective surgery. Um, I don't believe that elective surgery is exempted. No. Yeah, I mean, if I do a hernia, they're probably going to have enough pain. Uh, you can ask one of the persons who you just uh, mentioned about pain. So I, I think it's uh, opioid issue is not one acute prescription. It's the issue of uh, issuing a large amount of opioids for the minor elements and then continue to prescribe them there rather than just for one minor one, which is a patient comfort. So it just bothers me a little, especially when I see who the sponsors are and who the supporters are. It's still it's still having the requirements on the physician though, and it also gives them outs if they um, the only thing if they feel it's appropriate, and it gives them also the out that if the if they're in their professional judgment would be detrimental, they don't have to do it. So there is some um, some things in there that leaves it up to the prescriber's judgment. But, but Denise, I mean, I, I completely agree. It's unfortunate that we have to even consider supporting or not supporting legislation in this area. We shouldn't even be having this conversation because physicians should have been prescribing the proper amounts to begin with. And I can tell, I mean, everyone on this board knows that a significant number of the disciplinary and enforcement cases that we see on our panels involve opioids. So unfortunately, I, I think we, um, it's our duty to support something like this um, and make sure that patients are completely mm -hmm. educated about all their options because it's not, it's not taking place currently. And it, it's really unfortunate we have to legislate this. Any other comments? Dr. Yip? I think it's a good concept, but again, the implementation. You ask me, I talk to the patient, and the patient says, well, what else can I do? Where else can I go? I don't know who the acupuncture is good. I don't know who the chiropractor is good. So, mm -hmm. It's a good idea, but I think we need more work done. Thank you. Any additional comments? We have one um, public comment. Megan Allred. Thank you. Megan Allred with the California Medical Association and CMA as opposed to AB888. As we have serious concerns with the requirement that there, there be referrals to non-pharmacological treatments that often aren't covered by insurance, and the requirement to discuss these options even when they're not appropriate for the patient. The bill will add unnecessary administrative burden on physicians and add out-of-pocket costs to patients who believe they'll be receiving a covered service using this term of referral. So as you know, a referral in the physician world is a thing. It is a, often a piece of paper that tells you that you're going to go see a specific doctor and that that service often is going to be covered because you have a referral. The sponsors of the bill, the chiropractors, uh, believe this to be something more akin to a referral for like a neighbor to get uh, your house painted. And it's something where you would just discuss with them like this would be a good person. Maybe you should go see a chiropractor about this. And that's how they view the term referral, but legally that's not how it actually would be effective. So we have major issues with that. Um, we also think that it's inappropriate that if you get your wisdom teeth removed that your physician's gonna have to discuss with you acupuncture and chiropractic and um, other services that may not be appropriate at all when you really might just need a painkiller. Um, and so for all of those reasons, we're opposed. Are there any other comments from the public? Are there any comments on the phone? No comments from the phone at this time. Okay, we have a motion to support. 
Dr. Bolot. Aye. Ms. Friedman. Aye. Dr. Gonadev. No. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Krause. Yes. Ms. Lawson. Yes. Ms. Lubiano. Yes. Dr. Lewis. No. Ms. Sutton Wills. Yes. Mr. Warmuth. Aye. Ms. Wright. Dr. Yip. Yes. Ms. Pines. Aye. Ms. Simones. Okay, so the next one, and I want to just, before I go on to the next one, we have three scope bills that we'll be talking about, and um, just because they're so different than scope bills in the past, we are, uh, staff didn't include a recommendation, and, and it's just because, um, you know, we've historically opposed some scope bills, and they've all been very similar, and it's kind of like a re reiteration of the same bill, but these are all very different, and so we haven't really seen anything like them, so I'm just giving that before I go. So the first one is AB 890 Wood, and it has to do with nurse practitioners. Um, and it does give them independent practice, but it's very different than in the past. So this bill actually, I'm going to kind of summarize instead of going through every exact <coughs> requirement. But if you go to your analysis, the tab on your analysis, it has the exact requirements so you can look them over there. But basically it would create a new board within the Department of Consumer Affairs, which has never been done before. And it would basically, it would be called the Advanced Practice Register Nursing Board. And it would be, consist of nine members. Four would be um, NPs now, and then later on it would be NPs licensed under this bill. There would be, um, let's see, uh, four members. So three members would be li physicians licensed by either us or the Osteopathic Medical Board, and at least one of the physician members has to work closely with a nurse practitioner. And then, um, and then there would be two members that would be public members. And so basically it creates this new board and it's kind of two different pathways. So one is a pathway, um, if you work in a specified setting, which would be um, a licensed clinic, a health facility, a county medical so facility, or a group practice, in which one or, <coughs> sorry, in one or more physicians practices with the NPs. So if you work in one of these settings, it's kind of like you're working with physicians, you're working collaboratively, and it actually goes through what you can do, which is um, the NP can do without supervision, which is conduct an advanced assessment, order and interpret um, diagnostic procedures, establish primary and differential diagnosis, prescribe, order, administer, dispense, and furnish therapeutic measures. And it kind of lists what, which I'm um, including, but not limited to, I don't know if you want me to go over them, but diagnose, prescribe, and institute therapy or referrals to patient or healthcare agencies, sorry. Um, prescribe, administer, dispense, and furnish pharmacological agents, plan and initiate a therapeutic regimen. <coughs> and after performing a physical exam, certify disability and delegate tasks to a medical assistant. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so that's one pathway if you work in one of those settings. The next pathway is... <coughs> Sorry, this is going to happen. That um, if you practice outside of the settings, you have to have like additional requirements. So you practice, you can practice outside of those settings and not have supervision, but then you have to do extra things. So you have to have extra training. You have to hold a doctorate of nursing practice degree and hold active national certification recognized by the board, or <coughs> hold a master of science degree in nursing and hold national certification in an NP role by a national certifying body recognized by the board. And they also have to complete a transition to practice. This bill defines transition to practice to mean ad additional clinical experience and mentorship provided to prepare a nurse practitioner to practice without the routine presence of a physician. So the transition to practice consists of a minimum of three years or 4,600 hours of training. The transition to practice shall require profici proficiency and competencies identified by the new board and has to be conducted in one of the settings or organizations specified in the bill in which one or more physicians practice with the MP and after the required three years, the MP shall pass an objective examination. So they're going to have this additional training with a physician. They're going to ha have more education and then they have to pass an examination. And the examination has to test the proficiency competencies identified in the regulation, which this new board would do regulations for that. 
This bill specifies that the, um, the NP authorized to practice must practice within the scope of their clinical and professional education and training within the limits of their knowledge and experience. They must consult and collaborate with other healing arts providers based on the clinical condition of the patient to whom the health care is provided. They must establish a plan for referral of complex medical cases and emergencies to a physician or other appropriate healing arts provider. And they also have to maintain professional liability and appropriate for the setting. And it actually sub sub subjects NPs to existing law banning the corporate practice of medicine, which is a big one. They've never put that in this any NP bill before. And they're also subject to 805 peer review and reporting. So those are two things that um, <clears throat> in the past they've asked the NP bills to include and they never have. And so this one does have its own board. It has additional training. They made that three years, tried to be like similar to postgraduate training for nurses that aren't going to practice in those settings with physicians. So they tried to address a lot of concerns that have been raised by the opposition. Um, so that kind of sums it up. Like, you know, we've had the bills before. This is kind of the most, restri the most restrictive bill that we've seen for NP independent practice. We have opposed independent practice before, but it hasn't included all of these elements. So um, those are kind of just some of the things to consider when we discuss this bill. And Kim, do you have anything? And this is one where we just really want to get the board's feedback. We didn't actually recommend any position on this because we do want you to talk about this and we want to see where the board stands on it. Okay, Dr. Krause. We think we know what medicine and surgery is. Uh, and we believe that anybody who wants to practice some part of medicine or surgery that's not a physician may not be qualified to do it and should not do it. But, but that's not true. Uh, and if we take a case example of the podiatrists who have kind of marched their way up, they, they did it in a very commendable fashion. They did it with uh, education and supervision and collaboration with MDs, and there was a period of time where there was su supervision not only by the podiatric board, but by the medical board. So I believe that there are many people who can be well qualified to practice that which we call medicine or surgery, um, but that those people who wish to expand their scope not only need to demonstrate an education program and a clinical training with supervision program that will give us the confidence that they're being well educated and supervised, but that the medical board should ask for a period of time where there is oversight by both boards, including the medical board. And then just as we did with the podiatrists, after a period of time, the medical board no longer needs to provide that oversight. And I think the idea here was to create a new board that has physicians and nurses. And so creating, because I mean, what the technical system we've given in the past, it's hard to have two boards oversee one licensee because it's one person and it's hard to have two boards oversee. So what they try to do to um, address this issue was you have one board, but you're having physicians and nurses on that board. And so it's kind of being overseen by both because you're having physicians and you're having nurses. Mm -hmm. I believe that every consumer has the right to a high level of care and that even within medicine, if you're having a facelift, whether it be done by a dermatologist, a head and neck surgeon, or a plastic surgeon, that you have the right to expect that someone who's offering that service is well-trained, uh, safe, and will provide a safe, effective surgery and surgical environment for you. If you're having a medical or surgical procedure done by a certified nurse practitioner or any other allied health professional, I think we should do that in a setting where the consumer can trust that this person is licensed and the standard of care that will be followed is a uniform standard of care. I'm concerned that when you create a new board that's composed of physicians and nurses, that we're setting ourselves up for different standards of care. And although it may seem cumbersome to have oversight of two boards, uh, it works. The consumer can complain to both boards. Both boards need to be satisfied. So I would sooner that the medical board have oversight over those people who are expanding scope of practice rather than to look to create a plethora of new boards. Dr. Lewis? Yes. Um Yes, I echo uh, Dr. Krause's comment, but I'd also like to add a few more. Um, eventually, all nurse practitioners will become doctors of nurse practitioner. 
who will be able to call themselves doctor in the state of Washington that currently exists and probably other states. So that is a concern for me and may be misleading to patients. Um, there's nothing that can substitute what physicians have experienced with clinical um, exposure. And I don't think they, a nurse practitioner will ever have that kind of exposure that physicians have undergone. And so I worry about um, uh, sort of along the lines of maybe what Dr. Krause is saying is that um, we're calling these um, nurse practitioners doctors. They haven't had the exposure and it might be misleading to patients. And I also worry about um, creep, the creep of, of nurse practitioners into the medical profession without the proper training and without the proper environment for which they're most um, suited for. Any additional comments? Dr. Bullock? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> I'm very supportive of healthcare teams and everyone's role in it. Um, nursing has done an amazing job with its training, research, and education. But the fact is the number of hours that one is in training does matter. The 4,600 is fall short and then you know I also have had like some other people here on the board I've trained some amazing nurse practitioners however it takes many years for them to be able to just like with physicians it takes us a good seven eight ten years to develop our proficiency in practice I think, and maybe Jennifer, you can speak to this, some of the concern is the maldistribution of physicians in areas that are in need of care. And I, and I, and people that know me, that is something I feel passionate about. Likewise, I feel passionate about education. So I'm, I'm, I'm torn on this, but I do, I, at this point in time, I, I cannot support it as written. Dr. Gananadev? Our number one job is to high quality consumer protection and care. If you look at that, you go through four years of med school, out of that two years of rotations, and we just changed the licensing where start of next year, you need three full years of residency. That's what we expect minimum required to be practice medicine in the state of California. So why are we even looking at this one? It makes no sense to me. Any other comments? My clarification is whether this would put these nurses in the same category with midwives, podiatrists, uh, clinical social workers? Jennifer? Um, it, in what regards, Ms. Sutton? In, in terms of their, their licensing, um, I mean, they're not going to be seen as physicians. They're going to be seen as an advanced practice nurse. An advanced practice yeah. is, I don't, I don't find it confusing for the public to have a professional nurse. I don't think anybody would believe standing in front of a nurse that they're seeing a doctor. And it seems analogous to me, analogous to me with a um, clinical counselor or clinical social worker in that regard. It would be called the Advanced Practice Registered Nursing Board. So I mean, that would right. be the board that would oversee it. So that's... I believe they would <coughs> be able to call themselves doctor, though. I, I Carrie, I, if you can weigh in on that, because... Um, they have a PhD. So one of the requirements, um, one of the optional requirements is holds a doctorate of nursing practice degree or holds another degree. So if they held that degree, then they would be able right. to. It's not like they're a doctor <coughs> of medical doctor with an MD degree, but they would be mm -hmm. a doctor of nursing. Um, I know we, we've had complaints of this concern already where you have nurse practitioners, especially in some of the... Um, 
uh, retail areas where they're practicing nurse practitioners and to the public that go into them they don't identify themselves as nurse practitioners they wear white coats there everything and a lot of individuals get confused and believe that these mm -hmm. individuals are physicians but that is and that's um, existing launch I mean existing and that's making, right with yeah. existing this is right. I think you know public they I mean, the big difference that, is they're going to be practicing independently but, yeah yeah right but they will have all of these requirements on them and they'll have a different license and they will have their own individual license for that particular entity for what they're doing and a method of yeah. review to go with that extra right. mm -hmm. it'll be a board just like we're a board right. yeah. dr. Hawkins so I appreciate that there are increasing requirements for the uh, nurse practitioner to be able to practice more independently but I actually in a hospital setting where I am there's significant numbers of supervised nurse practitioners and physician assistants and there's confusion among patients uh, that actually are inappropriately addressed as doctor somewhat regularly. Um, I do have concerns about, again, the creep that I believe will happen with this, and so I'd be opposed to it as well. Any other questions, comments from members? No. Uh -uh. Yeah. I move to oppose. Um, uh, AD 890. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. I have a public comment here. Megan Allred. Thank you. Megan Allred with CMA. And CMA has worked extensively on the current language in the bill but still maintains an opposed unless amended position as there are significant details surrounding the duties of the new board in the bill, the training required for a solo certificate and consumer protections among others. We do not believe the bill will increase access to care as data shows that in other states with independent practice, nurse practitioners are not moving to rural underserved areas and there's no data to show that that will occur here in California. Mm -hmm. We believe there's significant work to be done on AB 890 and will remain imposed until that time. Are there any comments from the public? Eric? Just real quick to talk about what Kim just mentioned. I actually went to a GI doctor recently and did not see him. A woman walked into the room and said she works with the doctor and led me to believe she was another doctor. And I did not find out she was a nurse practitioner until I got home and looked her up. She wrote prescriptions for me on a prescription pad that did not have her name on it. It had the original doctor's name on it. And it was all very misleading. And she diagnosed me with irritable bowel syndrome, which I do not have, and wrote the prescriptions for irritable bowel syndrome. And when I called the pharmacy to ask what these, she actually sent me to a pharmacy. She goes, oh, and use this pharmacy because they know how to get around the insurance. And when I called the pharmacy to ask what these drugs were that were so, that needed this special attention, they said, oh, well, it's for irritable bowel syndrome. I don't have irritable bowel syndrome. So I, I was very concerned about this nurse practitioner portraying herself as a doctor when, when she wasn't. So that does happen, Kim. Mm -hmm. Are there any other comments from the public? Any comments on the phone? No comments from the phone at this time. Okay, we have a motion to oppose. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Kraus? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Yes. Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? No. Mr. Warmuth? Abstain. Ms. Wright? Yes. Dr. Yip? Aye. Ms. Pines. Aye. Next. Okay, moving on to the next bill. AB 1030 would require the board on or before July 1st, 2020, in coordination with the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, or ACOG, to develop an informational pamphlet for patients undergoing gynecological examinations, which must include specified information. This bill would require a physician primarily responsible for providing a patient an annual gynecological exam to provide the patient with the informational pamphlet required by this bill before a patient's first gynecological exam with the physician. 
This bill would require the physician to have the patient sign and date a form attesting that the patient has received the informational pamphlet and understood the contents before the gynecological exam with that physician. This bill would require forms showing receipt of the information to be kept as part of the patient's medical record. This bill would subject physicians who violate the requirements of this bill to existing law that authorizes an administrative fine upon a second and subsequent complaint against a physician who fails to provide the pamphlet. ACOG already has information, information for teens that address most of the requirements in this bill. This bill would require physicians to give information on gynecological exams to patients, which will help protect consumers by providing them information on a proper examination. This may help to prevent sexual misconduct and ensure that instances of misconduct are reported to the board. This is, um, you know, one of the reasons behind this is the Tyndall case where a lot of these students were going to this, the student clinic and didn't really know what a proper exam is. Um, a lot of this stuff ACOG has already done. They would have liked to just require ACOG to do it, but you can't require a private agency to do something in a bill, so that's why we're looped in. Um, because ACOG already has this information out there, um, it's board staff is recommending the board take a support position on this bill. Can I get a second? Uh, okay. Just Dr. a question, Kananadeh? so why is it, what are the amendments ACAG is looking for, it says suppose unless amended? Um, I'm not sure, I don't have the committee analysis in front of me, I, I'm not, yeah, I'd have to check with ACAG. I, I'm, they probably just don't, I, I'm in talking with their lobbyists, I'm not sure what exactly what their position is, but I think they have issues with assigning the, the form and, and that kind of stuff, but I'd have to double check what ACAG's concerns are. I mean, just uh, without going into detail, the concept is excellent. I mean, uh, no doubt uh, with, uh, with all these people, uh, some morons doing some things. So, uh, but I'm just, that bothered me. Why is ACOG, which was pushing this, what amendments they were looking for, that's what I was more interested in. Yeah, I'm not sure, I'm sorry. Any additional comments or questions? Any com oh, Dr. Bullock? Yeah, no, I just was looking here on uh, AB 1030-2. So, Jennifer, what it yeah. says is the ACOG document also provides a glossary of terms. So ACOG is saying it has already has this information, but what it didn't include is regarding privacy expectations and the telephone number for the board. I mean, that's what I see that here. Um, I'm just, I, I guess I'm like Dr. Gadonadev. I'm be interested in what the body was saying. I mean, I do support it, in, but it would be interesting to just understand what it is. I think it's probably the signature, perhaps. Right. That was an issue sign. that they had before. I mean, I think that they necessarily just didn't like the requirement, that they kind of think that information's already out there, but I haven't seen their letter, so I can't mm -hmm. speak for them. And, and it's not requiring us, I mean, in other words, most people, well, not most people, Many people use electronic health records, so someone can write information provided. It's not a form that needs scanning at all, is, do you know? It doesn't specify the, okay, actual, the form right. that has to be used, but the patient, okay. it has to be signed. It's attesting so that, that they've received the information. The patient has to sign it, attesting that the doctor gave them the informational brochure. I see. Okay. Which actually helps us in our enforcement endeavors because we have something to let when we get the patient's records, there's a signed form in there, but. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Any comments from the public? Any comments on the phone? No Any? comments from the phone at this time. We have a motion to support. Can I get who seconded that motion? I, I missed if that actually occurred. Did it in a second? Okay, Dr. Lewis. <laughs> Dr. Bolat. Aye. Ms. Friedman. Yes. Dr. Gonadev. Aye. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Krause. Yes. Ms. Lawson. Yes. Ms. Lubiano. Yes. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills. Yes. Mr. Warmuth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Yes. Dr. Yip? Yes. Ms. Pines? Aye. 
Okay, next bill, AB 1264. This bill would expressly clarify that an appropriate prior exam does not require a synchronous or real-time interaction between a healing arts licensee and a patient for purposes of prescribing, furnishing, or dispensing a self-administered hormonal contraceptive following the use of a self-screening tool. This bill would include an urgency clause and would become effective immediately upon signature. The board does not interpret an appropriate prior examination to always require a real-time interaction between a physician and patient. It depends on the circumstances of each specific patient and their medical history for a physician to determine what is an appropriate prior exam pursuant to the standard of care. The bill is clarifying in nature and board staff recommends that the board take a neutral position on this bill. I would need a motion. No, I have a really quick. Yeah, I do have something because, in fact, we were just talking about this, Susan and I, where it, you know, where it says the um, appropriate examination, and they're talking about the video chat, right? Mm -hmm. Am I looking at the right one? Let me just double check. Yeah, um, under the analysis where we're talking about this. I guess my question is, this is going to become more and more of, of, uh, of an issue when we're going to be looking, not just for this, but are, does it, is, it, is it correct that um, a prior examination, a good faith exam is the words I'm looking for, is required for many things, right? right? In this case, uh, and many others, this telehealth issue Carrie, would it, this, this would meet the, is, this, is it being, it says an appropriate prior exam to occur uh, after the use of the self-screening tool, and that's that whole asynchronous and synchronous. So what's going to be happening with the video, just not for now, but that's going to be an issue that's going to be coming up, right? A good faith exam, what does that mean? And I think that's going to be something to think about in the future. But I, I, does that make sense? I mean, I think it's already coming up. I think that they're doing this because... People are worried about certain things, but I mean, we always, when we get a call, Carrie gets calls, I get calls, what is an appropriate prior exam? We basically say it depends on that specific patient. There, we don't say like always you have to have an inpatient or never you have to have an inpatient because it has to be patient by patient basis. So this is basically just kind of clarifying that. That's okay. how we looked at All it. All right, yeah. that's fine. I thank you. Do you have anything to add, Carrie? <laughs> the, my only concern about it is that an appropriate prior examination okay. may sometimes require a synchronous interaction. Right. And they r really want to be able to rely on that self-screening tool. And if, if there's no contraindications identified in that self-screening tool mm -hmm. to for the purposes of, of providing uh, birth control, mm -hmm. be able to rely on that. So it it <coughs> is limited to that in this bill, um, and that may be appropriate. I think their argument is that there is less risk in permitting this and providing more access than there is in making it harder for people to get birth control. So that's my thoughts on it. Thank you. This meant my sense. Any other questions or comments? Mm -mm. Any comments from the public? <clears throat> Any comments from the public? Any comments on the phone? Okay. No comments from the phone at this time. Dr. Bolat. Aye. Ms. Friedman. Yes. Dr. Ganadev. Aye. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Krause. Yes. Ms. Lawson. Yes. Ms. Lubiano. Yes. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills. Yes. Mr. Warmoth. Aye. Ms. Wright. Yes. Dr. Yip. Yes. Ms. Pines. Yes. Okay, next bill is um, the opto optometrist bill. Um, and again, we didn't, rec we didn't recommend a position. So it would um, state the intent of the legislature to authorize ophthalmologists to enter into delegated service agreements with optometrists, which will increase the two professions' collaboration in the treatment of patients. Um, 
So this bill would allow, in addition to the authority provided the, by the Optometry Act, an optometrist to provide services set forth in a delegated services agreement between an optometrist and an ophthalmologist. This bill would define a delegated services agreement to mean a writing between an ophthalmologist and optometrist, authorize, authorizing the optometrist to perform services consistent with their existing act. This bill would allow optometrists to provide additional services that are set forth in the Delegated Services Agreement, which is required to be between that optometrist and ophthalmologist, does not require the ophthalmologist to supervise the optometrist. It would be more of a collaboration. But it does state that the Delegated Services Agreement can only authorize the optometrist to perform services consistent with their existing act, and that's existing law. So opening it up for discussion. You know, in practice, this already occurs, mm -hmm. where ophthalmologists are co-managing and collaborating in right. patient care. Uh, and they decide amongst themselves who's responsible for what. So I'm not understanding where the motivation is to create this in, in written format. Why is that needed? Well, I mean, all I can do is like point to the intent that the optometrist will improve access to quality care, options for screening, early diagnosis of systemic diseases. I don't, I don't maybe it's just a step towards, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, there's not really much opposition to it. So, I mean, looking at it, I would probably say neutral or, you know, we don't even necessarily. In general, to. I'm unopposed to unnecessary legislation, but I'm always suspicious as to why it seems unnecessary and what the real motivation is. At first, but, I actually thought it was a spot bill. There would be, like, more coming, but it <laughs> hasn't changed yet, so. But, but uh, neutral seems like a very good position, and I would uh, make that motion. Dr. Hawkins? Uh, second. And I'll sound like an echo because I don't understand the need for it either. Right. That's what so, Jennifer and I thought when we looked at the bill, too. <laughs> we're like, we're not sure where this is headed and right. where it's going. Dr. Bolat? I actually have a question for Dr. Krauss or anybody else, but he would be a good one to answer. So currently, are optometrists ordering smears, CBCs, and all those things? Because that's what I'm, I'm reading here. So I'm just curious if that is true. Yeah, maybe, maybe the devil is in the details. I'm, I'm not aware of, in practice, optometrists ordering uh, you know, diagnostic tests for evaluation of medical disorders. Mm -hmm. But again, as Jennifer stated, the intent of the bill is to have them continuing to practice in their current uh, scope of practice without expansion um, but with a written agreement in terms of uh, sharing management between the ophthalmologist and the optometrist. So in theory, if it talks about their ordering diagnostic tests, I, I would think that that's already within their scope, but I honestly oh. don't know. Oh, okay. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Kananadev? Yeah, just a comment. Uh, I don't know. In my 15, 20 years, I've been following the scope of practice. I never saw optometrist and California Medical Association agree on anything. So I'm just curious how this thing came about, what its need is. Uh, neutral, I'm good with neutral, but uh, maybe there is something more than what we see. I have no idea. In ophthalmology, there always is something more than you see. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any other questions or comments? Do we have a motion? There was a motion there was, to, uh, there was be was to, to neutral. Okay. okay. Any comments from the public? Any comments on the phone? Motion to stay neutral. No comments from the phone at this time. Ms. Cruz Jones? Dr. Bolat? Aye. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Yes. Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Yes. Dr. Yip? Yes. Ms. Pines? Yes. Okay, so the next bill, AB 1468, would establish the Opioid Prevention and Rehabilitation Act, which would be funded by manufacturers and wholesale, wholesalers of opioid drugs and would be repealed as of January 1st, 2028. This bill would create the Opioid Prevention and Rehabilitation Program Fund in the state treasury and would specify that all monies in the fund are continuously appropriated to the California Department of Public Health to carry out the requirements of this bill. 
This bill would require CDPH to distribute monies in the fund to counties or local nonprofit community-based organizations, including but not limited to community clinics, on an annual basis for purposes of opioid prevention and rehabilitation programs based on ap applications submitted by those counties or organizations that elect to participate. This bill would specify that distribution of monies in the fund to counties or local nonprofit community-based organization would be based on county needs using the most recent data of, of the information provided by CDPH. This bill will impose fees on manufacturers and wholesalers of opioid drugs based on the amount of opioid drugs they sold and distributed, which seems to be a reasonable funding source to contribute to the growing opioid abuse epidemic. This bill will help collect funding for opioid prevention and rehabilitation programs. The board took a supportive amended position on a similar bill in 2017 and requested an amendment to ensure that fees are not passed on to consumers. Until recently, this bill would have prohibited a manufacturer or wholesaler from passing the cost of the rateable share payment to the purchaser of the opioid drug, including the ultimate user of the opioid drug, and would have specified that if that cost was passed on, there would have been um, a penalty to the manufacturers and wholesalers. However, in recent amendments, those provisions were taken out of the bill. So um, board staff is recommending that the board again take a supportive amended position on this bill for the same reason. I need a motion. Can I Dr. Gananadev? Yeah, I'll make that motion, but uh, let me ask you, does this prevent California AG's office or State of California suing the opioid manufacturers and getting money out for what they made out of population? No, it doesn't address that subject at all in the bill. I mean, do we know if it really prevents it from doing, uh, uh, from State of California doing that? It shouldn't prevent it. it okay. Just, uh, because, I mean, that's what we did with the tobacco companies mm -hmm. for killing all these people. So I just, uh, the, if that affects that way, I have a real problem with the bill because they, they need to pay for all the costs they caused. Any other comments or questions from members? Any comments from the public? Any comments on the phone? Ms. Cruz Jones? I'm sorry, who who was the second? I didn't hear a second. Oh, there wasn't a second? I Can I get a second? Second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Bolat? Aye. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Yes. <coughs> Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Yes. Dr. Yip? Yes. Ms. Pines? Yes. Okay, moving on, AB 1544. Um, this bill is pretty complex, but I'm going to summarize it because it's very similar to a bill that we discussed um, previously that we took a neutral position on last year. And it has to do with community paramedicine programs. If you guys probably remember, there was a couple bills and we extensively discussed them. So I'm going to just summarize this bill. But like I said, it's very similar to 944 from, I believe it was last year, which we took a neutral position on. So it would establish the community paramedicine or triage to alternate destination act of 2020 and establish state guidelines to govern the implementation of community paramedicine programs or triage to alternate destination programs by local emergency medical service agencies, or LIMSAs, in California. It would sunset on January 1, 2030. So this bill would, similar to the other bill, would authorize a local emergency medical services authority within a county to elect to develop a community paramedicine program or triage to alternate destination program. It would define it, I'm going to call it CPP in the future here, Community Paramedicine Program, as a program developed by a local emergency medical service authority and approved by the Emergency Medical Services Authority, which is the state agency, IMSA, to provide community paramedicine services consisting of providing short-term post-discharge follow-up for persons recently discharged from a hospital due to a serious health condition, providing directly observed therapy to persons with Tuber tuberculosis in collaboration with the public health agency to ensure effective treatment and prevent the spread of disease and provide case management services to frequent emergency medical service users in collaboration with and by providing referral to existing appropriate community resources. This bill would define a triage to alternate destination program or TADP as a program developed by a local emergency medical services authority and approved by IMSA to provide triage 
triage paramedic assessments operating under triage and assessment protocols developed by that local agency that are consistent with the minimum triage and assessment protocols established by IMSA. Triage paramedic assessments may consist of providing care and comfort services to hospital patients in their homes in response to 911 calls, including grief support in collaboration with the hospice agency until the hospice nurse arrives to treat the patient, and providing patients with advanced life support triage and assessment by a triage paramedic and transportation to an alternate destination facility. So you probably remember before we had a lot of conversations about community paramedicine, tri alternate destination programs. This is very similar to the framework. So before we had opposed um, posed this kind of structure, but a lot of things were added in to, um, <clears throat> to make sure that they had um, effective oversight. And this bill includes a lot of those things. So the um, IMSA would be required to review that the local emergency medical authorities proposed um, CPP or TADP and review their program product protocols to ensure compliance with statewide minimum protocols. It would allow IMSA to impose conditions as part of approval. It would require IMSA to approve or approve with conditions or deny within six months. And it would require IMSA to develop regulations that establish minimum standards for the development of a CPP or TADP. This bill would require the Commission on Emergency Emergency Medical Services, which is an existing commission, to review and approve the regulations. And this bill would add specified members to the existing commission. This bill would require the regulations to be based upon and informed by the Community Paramedicine Pilot Program under HP, HWPP number 173 and the protocols and operation of the pilot projects approved. This bill would require the regulations that establish the minimum standards to consist of specified information and would require IMSA to develop and periodically review and update the minimum medical protocols of, applicable to each CPP and TADP. This bill would require IMSA to establish and consult with an advisory committee comprised of specified members, and it would require IMSA to submit an annual report on the CPP and TADPs operating in California <coughs> to the legislature and to repost the report on its website. The first report must be posted six months after the um, regulations are adopted and every January 1st thereafter for the next five years. And this bill would allow the annual report to include recommendations for changes to or elimination of certain program specialties that do not achieve the goals expressed in this bill. This bill would require IMSA before January 1st, 2028 to submit a final report on the results of the CPPs and TADPs to the legislature and require IMSA to contract with an independent third party evaluation to develop a final report. And that final report would include a recommend recommendations for changes to or elimination of certain specialties that do not achieve the community health and patient goals. As you remember, um, we did look at HWPP 173. Dr. Krauss um, worked with us on that. And we, we did have some patient safety concerns. However, this bill is very similar to a bill that the board took a neutral position on. And we took a neutral position because we recognize the important role that em <coughs> emergency responders play because it was, that bill was amended to increase the oversight of CPPs to add a sunset date and add requirements for additional protocols and enhanced reporting, which this bill does. This bill is sponsored by the um, ER docs and also by the California Professional Firefighters, and it kind of took everything good from the bills that everyone agreed upon and put it in this one bill. And mm. like, like I said, we were neutral before, so we're suggesting that we again be neutral. <coughs> Can I get a second? Second. Okay. Any questions from the members or comments? Any comments from the public? Any comments on the phone? No comments from the phone at this time. Okay. Ms. Cruz Jones? Dr. Bolat? Aye. Ms. Friedman? <coughs> Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Yes. Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Yes. Dr. Yip? Yes. Ms. Pines? Yes. All right. Months. Okay, moving on, SB 159. We know this bill would allow a pharmacist to furnish pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP and post-exposure prophylaxis PEP in accordance with protocols established by this bill, which are, you can be found on pages three and four of the analysis. This bill would require a pharmacist before furnishing PrEP or PEP to a patient to complete a training program approved by the Board of Pharmacy on the use of PrEP and PEP. 
This bill would require the Board of Pharmacy to consult with the California Pharmacists Association and the Office of AIDS within CDPH on training programs that are appropriate to meet the training program requirements. This bill would require Board of Pharmacy by July 1, 2020 to adopt emergency regulations to implement this, implement this bill in accordance with the CDC guidelines. This bill would prohibit a health plan or insurer from subjecting combination antiretroviral drug treatments that are medically necessary for the prevention of AIDS, HIV, including PrEP and PEP, to prior authorization or step therapy. This bill would prohibit plans and insurance for prohibiting or allowing a pharmacy benefit manager to prohibit a pharmacy provider from providing PrEP or PEP. This bill would require Medi-Cal to reimburse pharmacies for initiating and furnishing PrEP and PEP. Although the purpose of this bill is well intended, PrEP has risks from long-term use, including impaired kidney function and the depleting of bone mineral. PrEP can also cause drug interactions and requires regular rigorous monitoring and testing during use. This bill would also allow patients to obtain a full regimen of PEP without any requirement to see a physician for follow-up care. So for these reasons, um, board staff is recommending the board take um, an opposed position on this bill. Mm. I know we do have some public comment though on opposed? this one. Taken a pose? Well, I did. I mean, just to be um, fair, I did have some talk to Dr. Hawkins about this a little bit, and um, you know, the 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 other option that's kind of being thrown out there in the legislature um, is maybe prep. Um, prep is very complex, and you have to do a lot of testing. Dr. Hawkins can probably talk on this more, and so I know other organizations are opposed to the prep part, but maybe see some validity in allowing pharmacists to give pep. Um, for a full for a full round of PEP, and which is the post exposure, um, so that's another option to consider. But I think there was, uh, you know, after talking to some people and looking at reading the analysis, there's just some concerns about the testing and what needs. You know, I think that no one would argue that it's PrEP and PEP are a great thing and they should be utilized. But it's just you know, a pharmacist sufficient to to utilize them. And we will actually be having a presentation on PrEP and PEP from CDPH tomorrow. But um, this is basically allowing pharmacists to fill in that role um, to dispense these medications after they take training. So I'm recommending a pose, but that, you know, that could be changed. Mr. Walmart. Probably uh, goes without saying, but I disagree. Uh, I would say that not only is PEP and PrEP a good thing, it's been a game changer in uh, stopping the spread of AIDS or HIV AIDS. Uh, I would like to see the board support or at the very minimum uh, go to the, the issues that you've discussed and support uh, if amend, but amended <coughs> that uh, this, this is critical. And just to be clear, the pose, uh, the pose is not based on opposing PrEP and PEP. It was on who can provide that because I don't think that anyone agrees that, you know, PrEP and PEP is a great thing. It's just looking at who can, you know, provide that. So it just I just want to clarify that the pose and, wasn't based on that. And there are significant current barriers mm -hmm. to uh, getting PEP and PrEP mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. this bill is attempting to mm -hmm. address. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yes, I, I understand that Everybody likes pep and <laughs> Dr. Hawkins. Yeah, so um, pep and prep are really, really important preventive tools that are really being underutilized in certain communities for sure, and we'll hear about that tomorrow. Um, I just believe, and the reason why I say we should oppose is that even though the pharmacists, all the I's are died, all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed by making sure you follow CDC, I think it really puts too, too much pressure on the pharmacists. I really think that these the individual needs to be seen by a physician or mid-level who understands, although it's, it's, it is in the, um, um, the requirements in the training of the pharmacist, that they really have to be uh, HIV testing beforehand, uh, lab testing beforehand, uh, rechecked every four, three or four months. All these things are very, very important, and these individuals, uh, not uncommonly, or the population in general have additional problems that get in the way of, of uh, just following a protocol outlined uh, that the pharmacist will follow. Uh, again, it's really, really important to underutilize, and we'll hear more about that tomorrow, but I just think that this is not going to address the problem sufficiently and it creates a number of unintended consequences. Dr. Lewis? Uh, I don't have a problem with um, 
the post um, with the pre-exposure prophylaxis I think a physician needs to administer that or some health care provider but I I am strongly in favor of the PEP um, side of it and because I know that some of these people who get, get exposed are not near their primary care provider they don't have access to a clinic to provide that, and their only place to go is the pharmacy, and then initially, um, if they're at a party somewhere and they're not near um, their provider, then what do they do? And so what solution do you have for them? Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Hawkins, well, how can you help them? Okay, on a weekend. But. On a weekend. Um, during the week, they could go to a clinic, and they're. Uh, Palm Springs, we don't have it. Dr. Krause? Uh, I think access to these drugs is so critical that we should try to find a way to support if amended, or at worst, oppose unless amended. Uh, and certainly, one cannot simply take a drug for a long period of time and not have the necessary medical evaluation and ongoing care. Great. But we really don't want to delay or limit access to the drug. So I just think we need proper protocols uh, and maybe there even needs to be some basic testing service uh, available at the pharmacy, even if it's just blood draw. But it's, it's a national health crisis that needs to be addressed and we should find some way of supporting it. Ms. Hutton Wills. I agree that this is a, an important community access issue and that it, it sends the wrong message to oppose and that we should support mm -hmm. it. And if there are, uh, I'm hearing that there are valid medical reasons to, to amend it, then it should be amended. So we should support if amended. I just want to comment. I also take a support position mm -hmm. on it. Support Dr. Granano did. <clears throat> yeah, the, the, the concept is great. I think uh, my, my concern is where is the follow-up? Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we advise everyone to have a primary care doctor or a primary care provider if it is a NP or a PA. So if we can amend somewhere that they, they, they have to have some kind of follow-up, Pharmacists can't follow. That's not because they won't do the te they, they can't do the testing. They can't do a lot of other stuff. So if we can do that, that uh, I think I'm for it and support if amended is the right way to go probably. So we just want to be really clear with what the amendments. If we go support if amended, you guys can make that um, amendment or that motion, and then we'll need the, what those amendments are. Because do you want I to separate to it PrEP put, and PEP? Yeah, right. Or do you want to, you know, is that the first amendment? And then if there's, even with that, Dr. Ganadev, then do you want to put in some requirements that they refer back to their, you know, the individual back yeah. to the physician for follow-up? Or I could also probably work with a board member to come up with amendments mm -hmm. if we don't want to, you know, come because basically my letter has to include, like, we support it if it's amended it's, this way. So... Um, if we don't want to come up with all the exact amendments right now, um, I could work with a you could delegate you know, a yeah, board right. member to do that. I would delegate I mean, if, Dr. Hawkins. Yeah, I was just yeah. going to put <laughs> Dr. Hawkins. We've been appointed. That's fine. Okay. 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 So we we still do need a motion. So we need a motion to support if amended. Okay, I'll make a motion to support if amended. <coughs> second. Accordance with Dr. Hawkins. Correct. Okay. Second. We have a second. Second. Okay. Um, we do have a couple of slips here. Megan Allred. Thank you. So CMA has an opposed position on SB 159. Well, we'd hope to provide the medical expertise needed to ensure that this bill addressed access in a way that did not jeopardize patient safety. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Simply put, SB 159 seeks to increase access to PrEP and PEP medications at a standard that is lower than the standard of care provided at a physician's office, increasing the patient's risk. 
The bill in print allows a pharmacist to dispense 30 days of PrEP medication, a strong medication that demands a high degree of safety and consideration that could not be achieved at a retail pharmacist. Nothing in this bill ensures, ensures individuals see a doctor for follow-up treatment and care. The only thing SB 159 is likely to do is to increase the patient's challenges for adherence and therefore increasing the patient's overall risk of HIV infection. Providing, PEP, or providing PrEP in short-term doses at a retail pharmacy sets a dangerous precedent that it is okay for a patient who is at a higher risk of contracting HIV to not see a doctor. The medication, this medication should not be taken without ongoing monitoring and treatment, tasks that cannot be done or achieved at a retail pharmacy. SB 159 fails to recognize this and fails to provide adequate safeguards for patients. Again, CMA had hoped to work with the author to effectively expand access in a meaningful way to PEP or post-exposure medications. We believe that with the appropriate protections in place, PEP may be an appropriate medication to offer at a pharmacy setting because of the urgency with which a patient needs to begin that medication. CMA has negotiated protections in the past that safely expanded access to certain medications in a pharmacy setting, including naloxone and emergency contraceptives. These bills also allowed the medical board to develop procedures and protocols, which this bill does not allow. Unfortunately, the author has been unwilling to accept any medical guidance on the provisions of this bill, and his unwillingness to negotiate to remove PrEP has moved us to an opposed position. CMA has significant concerns about patient safety, adherence, compliance, and standard of care. We hope that the medical board shares these concerns and will also take an opposed or opposed unless amended position on 159. Thank you. Craig Pulsfer. Uh, good afternoon, Craig Pulsfer from APLA Health here in Los Angeles, one of the co-sponsors of this bill. Uh, Senator Weiner and his staff could not be here today, but they asked me to come and share a little bit why we feel this bill is so important. And I appreciate the robust discussion in the group, and I think we've actually addressed a lot of the concerns that have been raised here. And a number of physicians actually have been extremely involved in the crafting of this bill and provide feedback on the amendments that we've taken. So as has been said here, PrEP and PEP, are game changers in terms of our response to the HIV epidemic, but uptake is extremely low. A recent CDC estimate, it was about 15% of people who could benefit from PrEP are currently taking it, and it's even lowest among folks who could most benefit, communities of color, youth, women, trans women especially. So we need innovative, forward-thinking policies to increase access. Uh, just in terms of what the bill does, I think some important changes that were made. So the bill provides, allows pharmacists to furnish an initial 30-day supply of PrEP, so it's not complete, the complete course of PrEP. So it's an initial 30-day supply, and then the patient is connected with a primary care physician for ongoing care, and then it is the full course of PEP. As folks stated here, PEP is extremely difficult to access, especially on the weekend. Uh, late at night, so pharmacists are perfectly situated to provide access. New York State a couple years ago actually authorized pharmacists to provide a starter pack for PEP, and they're now considering allowing pharmacists to provide the full course. Um, you know, even CMA is supportive of the PEP provisions of the bill. Uh, with regard to PrEP, we think the bill strikes an important balance between providing improved access to the medication while also ensuring that the patient receives appropriate testing and follow-up care. So the bill states that patients actually have to have a negative HIV test within seven days before the pharmacist can dispense PEP or PrEP. That's consistent with CDC guidelines. And then the pharmacist actually has to order a test for kidney function. And if the patient has any kidney problems, the pharmacist has to notify the patient so that they stop taking PrEP. A study was actually just released out of New York City showing that rapidly starting PrEP before all labs are back is safe and feasible. And numerous studies have shown that providing rapid access to PrEP makes it more likely that patients will continue taking the medication for a longer period of time. So this is, bill is extremely innovative and important opportunity for California to be a leader in proving access to these medications. Uh, and we just really like to work with the medical board uh, on a constructive solution to improve access and really appreciate the support that folks have voiced. I think Sandra Wiener is 
certainly willing to, you know, any amendments that you all are willing to provide. The bill does ensure that the pharmacist notifies the patient's primary care provider about PrEP and PEP, and as I said, they have to connect the patient with the primary care physician for ongoing PrEP care. So thank you very much for allowing me to comment. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Any comments on the phone? No comments from the phone at this time. Okay. Ms. Cruz Jones? Dr. Bolat. Aye. Ms. Friedman. Yes. Dr. Ganadev. Aye. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Krause. Yes. Ms. Lawson. Yes. Ms. Lubiano. Yes. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills. Yes. Mr. Warmoth. Aye. Ms. Wright. Yes. Dr. Yip. Yes. Ms. Pines. Yes. Okay, moving on. SB 377. This bill would require a juvenile court <laughs> officer to authorize the board to review the minor's medical records limited to the diagnosis for the prescription in order to determine whether there is an ex excessive prescribing of psychotropic medications. For some background, the board receives very few complaints regarding foster children being prescribed psychotropic medications. So the board looked at other avenues to identify physicians. You guys probably remember this, but we did do a DUA with DHCS and DSS, and we requested a listing of all physicians who prescribed three or more psychotropic medications for 90 days or more. We looked at this information, had an expert pediatric psychiatrist review it, and it was determined um, that 86 children were identified as potentially being prescribed to inappropriately. <coughs> Sorry. Unfortunately, the board only received releases from four individuals. Without the authorization, the board cannot f move forward investigating these matters. Um, SB 1174 passed, which McGuire did, and it basically codified that DUA, the agreement. And we're kind of stuck in a bad situation because we can, we can uh, identify inappropriate prescribers, but we can't get the authorization to actually look in, into those cases. So um, the purpose of this bill is to resolve the, the current issue that we have. It gives the board the authorization to receive medical records for foster use um, in order to look at these cases. Um, in the bill right now, it's, 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 um, it's limited to the diagnosis, which isn't enough for an expert to review, um, make that determination. So we definitely support the intent of this bill, but um, an amendment may be needed, to, will be needed, to allow the board to obtain more information from the me medical records in addition to the diagnosis. So board staff is recommending the board take a supportive amended position on this bill. Need a motion. Can I get a motion? <laughs> so moved. Second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do I we have, have any Krause questions? And Dr. Bolot? Dr. Krause and Dr. Bolot? Sit. Yes. Yeah, second. Any Comments or questions from the members? Dr. Gananadev? Yeah, this, I mean, this Your mic. resolves the physician side of the issue, but I think the biggest problem here is, is the social services. Are we actually, remember, we had multiple meetings about how can the social services provide better services so that the doctors are not being dumped on to just prescribe medications, and that really bothers because a lot of child psychiatrists were very concerned that if this is so, they won't even see them. And there aren't enough child psychiatrists in the entire state of California. So we need to, this is appropriate, I'm not disagreeing with it, but if we don't actually do, the state of California doesn't do something with the Department of Health, Social Services supporting these, these, uh, these kids, I think they're going to lose any psychiatrists they have. That's what my concern is. Mm -hmm. So there was a Bureau of State Audits um, undertaking that looked at DSS, looked at DHCS involvement in the whole foster care issue, and then looked at our little portion of what we were looking at. And so I think a lot of that those issues were addressed in that Bureau of State Audits report with a lot of recommendations for all of the entities, actually. So I think a lot of the concerns that were brought up with the original article that came out and, and all of the follow-up have been addressed through that, that report, actually. And there's been a lot of meetings with those entities, and there will be follow-up making sure that they um, comply with those recommendations. Any other questions? Um, this is not a question, but in L.A. County, you can't prescribe psychotropic drugs for a foster child. The judges 
oversee that and it's looked at by others. So, I mean, that's a very large county. I don't know what's done in the rest of the state, so maybe this applies to the rest of the state. But in L.A. County, this is under control now. Yeah, it, it does apply to the rest of the state, and actually this would make it part of that court process. So when they go into the judge, this would also authorize that release during that court process. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other questions or comments from members? Okay, I have one from the public. Megan Allred. Thanks. CMA is opposed to SB 377 as it bypasses patient privacy on highly sensitive and confidential mental health records by authorizing their release without patient permission. We believe alternative methods should be sought to receive consent, but without that consent, these records should not be released without good cause and without patient permission. Okay. Any other comments from the public? Any comments on the phone? comments from the phone at this time. Okay. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Yes. Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Abstain. Ms. Sutton-Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmuth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Yes. Dr. Yip? Yes. Ms. Pines. Yes. Okay, next bill, SB 425. First, uh, um, this bill does include language that the board already approved as legislative proposals, and so we already support some of the provisions in this bill. Um, it, one of them is I'm striking the word comprehensive in front of summary, the, the summary that the physician receives. It um, requires probationary license information to stay on the board's website for 10 years. and. Um, and it changes the physician interview um, def definition in, um, of unprofessional conduct. So if a physician fails to um, attend their, the interview in absence of good cause, that um, current law requires that failure to be repeated. So those are the three that we've already supported, and I've gone to committee and testified that we support those provisions. So the provision that we are um, deciding on today would require a health facility or clinic or other entity that makes any arrangement under which a healing arts licensee is allowed to practice or provide care for patients to file a report of any allegation of sexual abuse or sexual misconduct made against a healing arts licensee to the appropriate licensing board within 15 days and would impose a fine for failure to report. This bill would require an employee of, or a healing arts licensee that works in any health facility or clinic or other entity who has knowledge of any allegation of sexual abuse or sexual misconduct by a healing arts licensee to file a report with the appropriate licensing board that has regulatory jurisdiction over that licensee and the administration of the health facility or clinic or other entity within 15 days of knowing about the allegation of sexual abuse or misconduct. This bill would require the licensing board to investigate the circumstances underlying a report um, this bill does have a pretty hefty um, fiscal just because we're going to get a lot more complaints and so we have to put that into our estimate for additional staff. It's a um, 3.8 million total cost for additional workload and enforcement costs um, associated with, you know, the increase in complaints and workload. The requirements for healthcare facilities and entities and employees and healthcare practitioners working in those facilities to report allegations of sexual abuse and misconduct by a licensed healthcare practitioner would further the board's mission of consumer protection and ensure the board is aware of these allegations so the board can look into incidences of potential sexual abuse and misconduct. I mean, I think everyone knows this is kind of brought on by the Tyndall case where there was like a lot of cases there that didn't get reported. We never got a report. And so this is, um, the, the author's office has been working on this and working with interested parties. So board staff is recommending that the board take a support position on that provision of this bill. Can I have a motion? to uh, approve the staff's recommendation. So moved. Do I have a first is Dr. Krauss and a second is Dr. W Mr. Wormuth. Okay. Um, any uh, questions or comments from the members of the board? <laughs> Dr. Anandev. <clears throat> Yeah, so when the, so the entity is investigating at the same time and they're reporting it to us. Is that what I correct? If right. there so is this, an allegation, the entity has to investigate too. This doesn't um, require necessarily, the, the required is in here is the reporting to the board. And so it doesn't change anything that, of like the peer review reporting process or anything. This is parallel to that process. 
But what it's really ensuring is that the board finds out about it regardless of what happens in any other process. So, and the reason why they have double reporting in the bill for the entity and the individual that knows about it is to ensure the board actually receives the information. So there was some concern if it just gets reported to the entity, that the healthcare you know, facility or clinic, that it won't get reported to us. So the double reporting by the actual individual and the entity is so we can kind of check and balance those reporting and make sure that it's actually being reported to us and not you know squashed or so what happens after the entity unless it is like a USC which ignored a lot of stuff uh, which right. uh, which appropriately con uh, concludes that there was no misconduct it, do it, that does it anything to do with do they send that to us or we do a, a pre, our own investigation it's a new process and it's pre whatever investigation they do they get a report and they send it to us and then we do our it, nothing changes for us, so this is just a way for us to get information. So it still goes through our full enforcement process. It would be handled like any other complaint. It's just a, w a new tool, I guess you could say, for us to get that information. Instead of just relying on, okay, the entity's gonna look at it, and if they don't find anything, we never find out about it. Okay. Any other comments from uh, board members? Dr. I just want yep. to clarify the time in reporting is that Let's say in the hospital, if a uh, employee or nurse or patient complain the doctor of sexual misconduct, usually go to physician well-being, the chief of staff, etc. So with this bill, there would be they need to report even before the whole process is completed. Yeah, I think there's some talk of maybe amending it to only not be nurse, you know, employees of that facility complaining about each other. But the purpose is for a patient in that facility, like I said, like in the Tyndall case, if I'm a patient and I let someone know that works at that facility, for the board to get that report. So you have the facility reporting and you have that person who received the report, both reporting it to us. So, and, and then, the, you know, the facility would do whatever whatever their normal process is, but the, the difference is they're doing that kind of like automatic report to us. And then we do our normal process and they do their normal process. So kind Excuse of adding me. another avenue. <coughs> Are you saying that without this, USC did not need to report to the board? Or was um, not required to report to the board? Um, that's what I think that, Kim and Carrie, I need your help for a minute. They're, they're saying about the USC, was they, were they required to report to that? Is that still an investigation? Or? Oh, we can't talk about that case yeah. right now. Okay. okay. Here, here's, uh, who had a question? Carrie, you were going to make a comment. One thing I, I just thought of that th this, when the board gets this report, it's going to trigger that statute of limitations running. True. And so if, if the other processes that may gather more information don't happen until after that statute runs, that three-year statute runs, that could have a negative impact and you know senator hill may be able to address that um that may never be an issue things may happen within that three-year time period but um this will start that time clock yeah but i think the flip side is that we may never find out about right. it that's right that's true too <laughs> that's what they're trying to avoid any other comments or questions from members? No? Do I have something in front of me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Megan Allred? I promise this is our last oppose. <laughs> <laughs> so CMA is opposed unless amended to SB 425 due to its overbroad approach to addressing a narrow yet egregious issue. We believe the bill needs additional specificity in the circumstances that trigger the reporting requirements to ensure that the allegations have some merit and that there are proper training and policies in place to ensure that employees and staff are aware of their reporting obligations and compliant and complaints are properly communicated to appropriate supervising or HR staff. We support the intent of the bill, but believe there are technical changes critically necessary to ensure that it properly addresses an important issue without having an overly broad and duplicative and burdensome requirement. Julie Filmus. Good afternoon, Julie D'Angelo Felmuth, no longer with the Center for Public Interest Law. 
Um, I realize this is a pending case, so I want to be very careful about what I say. Um, there are a number of laws on the books, and there have been for decades, requiring hospitals and clinics to report certain peer review actions um, to the medical board and to other appropriate licensing agencies. There is widespread non-compliance with those laws and widespread confusion about those laws among the hospital and clinic community and their legal advisors. You are not getting 805 reports because 805 is somewhat incomprehensible and there's, it is the subject of much dispute among doctors and their lawyers about when those reports need to come in to you. And that can take years. You are not getting 805.01 reports because up until about a year ago, there was no penalty for violating that reporting requirement. Uh, the bottom line is that hospitals and clinics really don't want to report this stuff to you because they don't want to be sued by the doctor they are reporting. And that is a real problem for you and that is a real problem for patient safety. There is a clear need for a clear law that requires immediate reporting of these complaints of sexual misconduct to the appropriate licensing board so that the board knows and the board can undertake an investigation soon, as Ms. Webb pointed out. Yeah. Um, in a, as to the additional investigations and the additional costs that Ms. Samos mentioned, you should welcome that because that is your job. Uh, if hospitals and clinics were complying with Section 805 and Section 805.1, you would get those reports anyway. You would just get them much later, and, and many more patients might have been victimized during that time period. Um, so, but you're not getting them. So you should support this bill because it clearly sets forth the reporting requirement for an egregious, egregious abuse um, of, that we've seen far too much of. Thank you. Marianne Hollingsworth. Ooh, you okay? Good evening, my name is Marion Hollingsworth, and I'd like to thank you for including the doctor interview issue in SB 425. I appreciate your willingness to talk to me about the issue of doctors being able to postpone interviews repeatedly, which adds to the total time of the investigation. I also appreciate your working with Senator Jerry Hill's office to uh, craft this portion of SB 45. And also in general, I applaud this bill in general. Hospitals should be accountable for sexual misconduct reporting in their facility and should report allegations immediately. And we come across cases sometimes even through the CDPH that aren't being reported. So uh, we always try and make you aware of them when we find out and Eric's going to talk about when we found. Thank you. Are there any other additional comments? I think Carrie makes a good point about the trigger, but I think it's important too that we inform potential patients about these doctors who are sexually assaulting people. And I'm going to talk about something because I'm hoping you're working on this case, so I'm not going to talk about the case, but I'm going to try and skirt around it. We were made aware, and if you follow our Twitter feed and our news reports, of a uh, report from the CDPH called a 2567 that outlined a doctor who had sexually assaulted numerous patients while they were unconscious. I did a Public Records Act request for the CDPH to find out if they reported that to the medical board, and they basically said no. So we know that they're not reporting this stuff to you. So I'm also wondering if 2567 reports, even though they don't mention the doctor's names, should also be turned over to the medical board when they involve doctor sexual assault. Any additional questions from the public? Any questions on the phone? No comments from the phone at this time. Okay, we have a support if amended. Is that what some? Support. Support. Just support. Okay. It's the Move to support. Okay. Second. We we actually already have a, a second. We have a motion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Already done that. Dr. Okay. Krauss yeah. and Mr. Warmoth. I didn't hear that. Dr. Bolat. We know my Brenda, did you have something? No. Okay. No. Uh, aye. <laughs> Ms. Friedman. Yes. Dr. Gonadev. Aye. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Ms. Lubiano? Yes. 
Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills. Yes. Mr. Warmoth. Aye. Ms. Wright. Yes. Dr. Yip. Yes. Ms. Pines. Yes. Okay, our last bill <laughs> for the night. <laughs> Okay, last scope bill two. So SB 697 would revise the Physician Assistant Practice Act regarding physician supervision. So originally this bill would have actually struck physician supervision, but um, uh, the author's offices work with stakeholders, and basically what it does now is it makes PA supervision more um, on the same playing field as nurse practitioner supervision. So what it would do is it would um, strike all references to the delegated services agreement and replace those with a practice agreement. This bill would define a practice agreement as a writing developed through collaboration among one or more physicians and one or more PAs and if, and if applicable administrators of an organized healthcare system that outlines the medical services the PA is authorized to perform and that grants approval for physicians on the staff of an organized healthcare system to supervise one or more PAs in the organized healthcare system. This bill would require the practice increment to include the types of medical services a PA is authorized to perform and how the services are performed, policies and procedures to ensure adequate supervision of the PA, including but not limited to appropriate communication, availability, consultations, and referrals between a physician and the PA and the provision of medical services, the methods for continuing evaluation of the competency and qualifications of the PA, the furnishing or ordering of drugs or devices by a PA, and any additional provisions agreed to by the PA and the physician or organized healthcare system. This bill will require the practice agreement to be signed by the PA and one or more physicians or a physician is authorized to approve the practice agreement on behalf of the staff of the physicians or the staff of an organized healthcare system. This bill would specify that it shall not be construed to require approval of the practice by the physician assistant board. This bill would prohibit P PA physician supervision from requiring the physical presence of the physician. This bill would authorize a PA to perform the medical services if the, if the PA renders the services under the supervision of a physician who is not subject to discipline. The PA is competent to perform the service, and the PA's education, training, and experience have prepared the PA to render the service. This bill would prohibit the act from requiring a physician to review or countersign a patient's medical record who is treated by a PA unless required by the practice agreement. This bill would allow the physician assistant board to require the review of or counter signature um, for probation license, probationary licensees. This bill would redraft the provisions of law related to PAs ordering drugs and devices in relation to the practice agreement changes. This bill would allow a PA to furnish or order a drug or device in accordance with the practice agreement and consistent with the PA's educational preparation or for which clinical competency has been established and maintained. This bill would require the practice agreement to specify which PAs may furnish or order a drug or device, which drugs or devices may be furnished or ordered, under what circumstances, the extent of physician supervision, the method of periodic review of the PA's competence, including peer review, and the review of the practice agreement. This bill would require the PA, when furnishing or ordering drugs or devices, to adhere to adequate supervision agreed to in the practice agreement. This bill would require the supervising physician to be available by telephone or other electronic communication method at the time the PA examines a patient. <coughs> this bill would, um, would expand the number of PAs a physician can supervise. So um, right now it's four, so this would up that to six. So like I stated before, this would have removed physician supervision of PAs. This bill has been worked on by stakeholders, um, and the purpose of this bill is to align PA supervision requirements to those of a NP. Um, the current version of the bill, like I said, is resolved negotiations, and there have been the um, there's there have been some concerns raised in committee when I went um, regarding increasing the number of PAs that a physician can supervise, especially in emergency department settings, <coughs> but. Um, but for the most part, um, this is a negotiation between all parties. So I'm going to open this up for discussion. I know there's public comment here, the people that want to talk about this bill. So, all right. <coughs> Dr. Gunanadev? Yeah, just uh, is the reason for the ER docs to oppose is the number? Yeah, yeah I think, I'm not sure they, what, if they're, they're, I think it's either opposed unless amended or they raise concerns in committee with the number. I believe their official position is opposed unless amended. Uh, uh, just because I saw the supporting organizations, almost uh, majority of the <coughs> physician organizations are there except the ER docs. So I was right. just curious why ER docs are opposing. That's the main. That's what they brought up in committee on their their public comment. Okay. 
Okay, I'll, uh, I'll make a motion to support. Can I get a second? Oh, Dr. Hawkins? So I'm just trying to figure out what the major difference is between the way it operates now, because I'm not 100 percent sure. Is it the I think practice Catholic agreement? I probably talk to this a little bit better than yeah. I can, but okay. the, they, right now they have a delegated services agreement that really is specific on what services they can perform and they can only be with one physician, I believe. This will, would allow a little more broad, like NPs have standardized protocols and procedures. And they can be with multiple physicians, so that kind of um, bases it on that. And right now they have to have medical records review and the, the physician has to sign off on that and that it's taking away that requirement. And there might be others that maybe Kappa can speak to. Am I Kim? <coughs> Dr. Kraus? We have the good fortune of having uh, interested, knowledgeable parties in the room. So, so would we have an opportunity to further discussion after we hear from them? Okay. And, and I do want to point out, you have um, two things on your, on your, um, in front of you. You have a letter that was provided to you by the um, Physician Assistant Board. Um, who actually took a, a, a pose and less amended position. So that's there for you. They've asked for it to be handed out to you. And then um, uh, Kappa, the comparison of PAs and NPs in California, that's their document. So just wanted to let you know that's what you have in front of you. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments by members? Uh, just, just a comment on uh, point, the, the, the delegated services agreements are sometimes somewhat difficult with uh, when do you have PA residency program. We have PA residency programs in orthopedics, uh, emergency medicine, and uh, OBGYN. And each time they rotate through surgery department, all of us has to sign PA delegation agreement. They're just, they're being trained there. Actually, they're not. It's like any other resident rotating through. So uh, it doesn't change anything. So as long as they're under the supervision of the, of the physicians in a, in a team, I'm fine with it. They function similar to NPs in, in our group. So that's why I, I don't have any problem. Dr. Lewis? Uh, Jennifer, isn't another part of this uh, legislation the number of physician assistants that a physician is um, able to supervise. That's a big part that we have not discussed. I believe I mentioned it. So now it's four, and this bill would expand it to six. And that's why the member of the ER docs are opposed to that portion. And the um, other physicians who are not ER docs are not opposed, or anybody else taken and opposed to it? I believe to that um, CMA is now in support of this bill. But CMA can speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do we have any other additional comments from members? Okay. Megan? <laughs> Thank you. So while CMA was opposed to the bill as introduced, as it removed all references to physician supervision, CMA worked extensively with CAPA to address their goals of reducing administrative burden, including replacing the delegation of services agreement with a practice agreement, aligning drug furnishing requirements with those of the nurse practitioners and the removal of chart review requirements as requested by the PAs. We believe that the current bill in print addresses many of the PAs concerns regarding administrative burdens to address scope of the services provided by the individual PAs at the practice level while maintaining adequate physician supervision but providing for more flexibility. CMA believes that many of the concerns expressed by the PA board can be addressed through clarifying technical amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Gay Bremen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ganadev said it very very well, I think. Um, this needs to work like it does for nurse practitioners. It, not every physician should be on a delegation of services agreement. It should be done at the practice level um, and make it easier. Um, 697 is a work in progress. Um, the bill is introduced, as Megan said, was optimal team practice, which is a national proposal that kind of got everybody scared. Um, our own members uh, called us and said, what are you doing? Are you doing independent practice? Um, we did a cover because our membership was so worried about that. So PAs want to work in teams with physicians. This is not independent practice. I know Jennifer put this in her three scope bills, but I think it started out maybe as a scope bill. 
and now it's not. Now it's a, how are PAs going to be regulated, Bill? And it's getting rid of those barriers that exist. And I talked about the history earlier, how those barriers got there. Mm -hmm. We're past it. We've got to get past it. And we need um, to modernize how PAs are regulated. And I think this bill does it. We have worked really well with the CMA and Dr. Uh, Senator Caballero's office. So I think this is just a way to make PA practice um, more in par with nurse practitioners, and that's really what we want. Um, we are going to talk to the author and take the ratio back down to four from six. The ER docs um, felt that because of the acuity, um, the, in the original bill, it's at the practice level. It's whatever that system or that office or that hospital wants, but we're going to go back to four, and the author's been told that. Okay. Any other questions from the public? This, Mr. Grant provided this. Mr. Grant provided this very nice letter for us. Would he be willing to uh, tell us it? what the amendments are that would be appropriate to making this uh, bill palatable? Can, can I say one more thing? I should have addressed that before Mr. Grant comes. So the, 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 you heard Mr. Grant earlier that the, um, their opposition was that it was too restrictive, not that they thought it was more. Um, so that is the problem, and we're working on the language with the CMA so that it, they won't have to regulate it so restrictive. Okay. okay. <clears throat> well, I've uh, been eating a lot of cough drops, so it didn't <laughs> help. Um, we had a great meeting with the author and the um, other stakeholders. Uh, the letter outlines some of the issues we had, but it doesn't really talk about how we would fix those. And like Gay said, it is a work in progress. So we went to the author. We said, hey, these are some current concerns we have, and uh, we've agreed to, to work with them to remedy those issues. One thing that I think is really interesting that came out of that meeting was the uh, medical board and the nursing board um, mostly regulate um, post issue, right? So you have some foundational rules you set, and then if people fail to meet the standard of care, you, you regulate on that, you discipline the license. A lot of the PA Act is set up where the restrictions are placed before the practice, um, before the harm takes place, um, and so because of that, that's mostly where a lot of these issues come from. And it would be nice, I think the intent is to make the regulation the same for all three of those uh, medical professionals, to remove some of those restrictions on the front end and regulate them the same way. And I think once we get that language sorted out, um, it, you know, hopefully we can take a support position. I'm very hopeful after the meeting. Hope, that wasn't a very specific answer, but I hope that it answered your question. Thank you. Sure. So are you, are you asking us to, are you, is, has your recommendation changed from what you've written here? Cur currently, the language of the bill hasn't changed, so the board's position hasn't changed. Um, but we anticipate working with CMA and CAPA on remedying these things. Uh, we don't have another board meeting until August, mm -hmm. um, but if there's new language before then, we can look at trying to do something sooner. I anticipate our position will change, but because the language of the bill hasn't changed in our current law, under this bill, we wouldn't be able to regulate very well, and that's why the, the position is there. But we do, uh, after our conversations uh, with all of the stakeholders, one of the issues we had is we, did, we weren't privy to the language until about three days before our meeting. So um, I'm sure that you all look over a lot of these bills before you come to the meeting, it was a little bit difficult for us to really dig in. We had some issues with that, and that's part of why that position was there, I think. Um, but we anticipate a change in position as the language is amended. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Do, do we have any other, Dr. Gananadev? No, I, I, I have a motion. I don't think it's seconded yet to support. No, it wasn't. Okay. So we have a motion to support? support? No, it almost sounds like we would really yes. prefer to support if amended, but we don't know how it will be amended. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, correct. I need to amendments if we're going to take support of amend. So, I mean, we could take support, and I could just continue to work with the author's office and uh, stakeholders. We don't. I, have I'm okay with amendments. actually support yes. if, I'm, if I'm amended. Either way, basically. Yeah. But I don't have amendments, so I can't right. take a support of amended position with. I have to put the amendments in the letter, so. I could say we support it and we'll continue to work with the author's office and stakeholders. Sounds okay. good to me. <laughs> Doctor, go ahead. Is it sufficient D if Jennifer, it is to say, legal. Uh, support <clears throat> if amended in line with the concerns outlined by the board in the letter? I don't think they have actual amendments in there. <laughs> no. the, the thing is, when I write a they support. They have concerns. If, yeah. Right, but when I write up a supportive amended letter, I actually need to put the amendments in that letter. Like, mm -hmm. if you take these amendments, then we'll be in support. That's how we usually do our supportive amendments. How about letters. support, maybe? It's up to you guys. You can figure it. You can write something. <laughs> okay. If, if we don't have the amendments, I, you're right, we, do, we can't put support if amended. Right. So my motion still the same, that is support. Okay. And you work with the author on the amendment, so. Right, I work with the author and physician assistant board. And okay, we have a motion to support. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. I got all the questions, right? Yeah. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Kraus? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Abstain. Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Abstain. Mr. Warmoth? Abstain. Ms. Wright? Abstain. Dr. Yip? Abstain. Ms. Pines? Aye. What do we have? Okay. Uh, we have enough to, okay, I just want to yeah, sure. we do. Okay, we have our next item is 9B, status of regulatory action. Ms. Simones, please okay. continue. <laughs> My last one. Okay, the matrix is in your legislative packets, page BRD 9B-1. Um, a quick update, a regulatory hearing was held on the approved postgraduate training regulations on March 11, 2019. There were no public comments at the hearing and only one written comment that was non-substantive. These regulations were adopted by the board at that hearing and this regulatory package is in the final review stage before it goes to the Office of Administrative Law for submission. So that's my update and I'm just here to answer any questions. Do we have any questions or comments from the members? Any comments from the public? Any comments on the line? No comments from the phone at this time. Okay, great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Um, let's move to our next agenda item 10, discussion and possible action on recommendation from the Special Faculty Permit Review Committee, Dr. Bolat. Okay, thank you, President Pines. On March 14, 2019, the spe Special Faculty Permit Review Committee held a teleconference meeting. During the meeting, the committee reviewed and discussed one applicant, Dr. Frederick J. Kolb, for a special faculty appointment with the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine. And if you wanna know where we are, go to BRD 10-1 in your meeting packet for detailed report on Dr. Kolb's qualifications, medical school and postgraduate training. Dr. Kolb's area of expertise is surgery, specifically in the area of reconstructive microsurgery of the head, neck, and breast. Dr. Kolb currently holds the positions of Chief of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Department of, at the Institut Gustave Roussy in France and consultant for the French National Oncology Organization. Dr. Kolb is the founder and educational coordinator of the European School of Reconstructive Microsurgery and European Master of Free Flap Reconstructive Microsurgery educational programs at the University of Catalonia and University of Paris. Dr. Kolb was instrumental in the transformation of the clinical program at the Institut Gustave Roussy to become an internationally recognized treatment center for cancer therapy and reconstructive surgery. 
If approved by the board, Dr. Cole would hold a full-time faculty appointment as professor of clinical surgery at UC San Diego. Dr. Kolb will work with UC San Diego and its affiliated medical centers where he will perform surgeries pertaining to cancer resections, microsurgical breast reconstruction, and other complex post-oncologic reconstruction. UC San Diego has demonstrated that Dr. Kolb is academically eminent to hold a full-time professor clinical faculty appointment at UC San Diego. The committee has reviewed Dr. Kolb's application and qualifications and recommends that the board approve Dr. Kolb's application for a special faculty permit appointment. So this concludes my report. Are there any questions from the Thank board? You. So moved. Okay. Second. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So I have to make the motion, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> he did. <laughs> okay. So okay. So we got it. We're going to approve Dr. Kolb for the business and profession section two one six eight point one a one cap a special appointment at UC San Diego. So it was so moved and seconded. Okay. Any questions from the members? Okay. Any from the public? Any on the line? No phone comments at this time. Okay. Ms. Cruz Jones? Dr. Bullot? Aye. Ms. Friedman? Aye. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Kraus? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Abstain. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Yes. Dr. Yip? Yes. Ms. Pines? Yes. Okay, moving to the next item, which is item 11, discussion and possible action on questions pertaining to impairment on applications for licensure and registration. Ms. Kirschmeyer. So if the members would please turn to agenda item 11 or BRD 11-1 to 2. At our last meeting, staff provided the members with suggestions for amending the impairment questions on the licensing application based upon information the board has received from interested parties as well as the Federation's policy on physician wellness and burnout. After reviewing the changes at the last board meeting, the members voted to table the discussion and requested a board member task force look at this issue and, and come back with recommendations after staff conducted some research. That ta task force was made up of Board President Pines and Vice President Dr. Lewis. Um, staff researched other states' applications as well as other task, uh, excuse me, as well as other California boards' applications. The researched information was shared with the task force and after discussion with the task force, we are recommending that the questions be amended as provided in 11-2. And if you look at that last page, you'll see those questions there. You can see that question one has been left in asking about any participation in a recovery program, but it has been changed to request current information. In addition, questions two, four, and six have been deleted, but questions three and five have been reworded to have the applicant answer the questions if they are currently impaired or have a condition that impairs them. It is believed that with these questions now focusing on current impairment and not illness diagnosis or previous treatment, that's what that's going to provide. The task force and staff believe that these questions eliminate all of the open and unlimited questions while still ensuring the board can still perform its role of consumer protection. In addition, the board obtains information from medical schools, postgraduate training programs, and other states on individuals going through the application process or as they're getting licensed that can be used to assist in identifying a physician who may have an issue. Um, and then I just ask Ms. Pines or Dr. Lewis if they have anything to add. I don't. Nope. No. <laughs> then with that, I would actually ask for a motion um, to approve the changes as recommended in 11-2. So move. Second. Second. Any questions from the members? Any comments? I have a question. Yes. For question number three, where it said, the last part says that impairs your ability to practice. I'm curious what, why we leave that in there, thinking that who would say yes? And thinking that it would be the last part where the person who, the applicant, it would be in their opinion whether it impairs. Whereas if you leave that out, then at least they could disclose something and then we would have information and to investigate further. 
So right now it actually says that impair, impair your ability to practice medicine safely is what the current language says. So we're taking out the may and we're saying that it actually impairs their ability right now. And and so you're asking why take the may out? No, no, no. Why no. no. I'm she sorry. Said you take the whole thing out. Yeah, why, yeah, why not just leave that whole part out? The part that says that impairs your ability to practice medicine safely. Because it's it's open. Well, I guess, Carrie, that is a question, I guess. I know it might not be as open as I think. Because the board's decisions need to be made <coughs> on those conditions that impact their ability to practice medicine safely. Just because an individual has a condition, it's only if it impacts their ability to practice medicine safely even in looking at the section 822 of, of the business and professions code. I guess the, the, the question I think you're asking is, is that inviting and, uh, oh sorry, is that inviting some type of opinion on their part where we might disagree? So if we collected the information, um, uh, I'll use a, probably a bad example. Say they have a substance abuse disorder, um, they don't believe it impairs their ability to practice medicine safely so they don't disclose it maybe okay. they would disclose it if we just asked if they had a disorder i don't know and it and it it's going to depend upon again yes. what we hear back from the medical school from the postgraduate training program of what we're getting to compare that to or if they're already licensed from their other licensing board do they have that even though ultimately it's the applicant's opinion I think it's important to have on the record mm -hmm. so that we don't review a case later on and say, well, didn't you recognize the impairment that this condition created? Uh, we don't want them to say, well, maybe, but you didn't ask. So I think, I think the record of their opinion is an important one, even though it is their opinion. I know the way the questions were worded before, but have you ever had a person answer, yes, I can't practice safely? Yes? Yeah, yeah. we have individuals that put this in here, because right now the question, it says, have you, well, I guess it, right now it says, have you ever been diagnosed with an emotional that impair your ability to practice medicine safely? The, the board has the ability to give someone a limited practice license, and it is better for them to disclose this so that the options can be provided to them. Uh, all of this stuff is cross-checked with a lot of information, and this is coming to you now to get ahead of um, pending litigation that the board can expect if this is not addressed. Dr. Gananadev? Yeah, my understanding was that our questions were so broad that uh, FSMB took it on and there was some litigation going on. Or is, that, is that correct? Because in, in other states, yeah. not in California yeah. yet. Yeah. Do we have any other comments from members or questions? Okay. Good afternoon, Julie D'Angelo Felmuth. I have a comment that's really more of a question and it relies, it, 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 it um, bears on what Ms. Webb just said. In as much as the board does have this authority to issue a limited license, why would you delete questions four and six? It, so may, four maybe, is, maybe I can see four, you could, but six is asking you about a current condition. Do you suffer from a progressive disorder, et cetera, that will likely result in a general decline? It's not asking about their ability to, to practice now. Do they have the qualifications necessary to be issued a license? Uh, if they can practice safely now, I mean, essentially, all of us who are licensed have a progressive condition. <laughs> <laughs> right. And if I, <laughs> you know, so that's, 
the thought behind it. You know, two years from now, they may need to come to the board and say, I have this condition. Mm -hmm. I know I need to disclose it to you so I can continue to practice without someone reporting me and getting in trouble. I know I will have to have limitations, but I can do X, Y, and Z. That's reviewed with a medical doctor. Um, it, it, this is this is your regular, normal, old application form to be licensed as a physician, right? Is there a separate application for a limited license? Yes. Where some of yes. this stuff. Okay. They have to go through that, and there's a doctor's certificate that they have to provide Thank with you. it. Yeah. Uh, Lisa Matsubora. Good evening, Lisa Matsubara for the California Medical Association. CMA appreciates the board's careful consideration of this issue. Uh, CMA does believe, however, that the board should seek to keep the questions worded generally to focus on the applicant's ability and competency to practice safely without regard to the type of impairment and not to stigmatize one type of impairment over another with an understanding that the board always has the ability to follow up with additional questions as they review, it, review an application if they believe that it is appropriate. As a proposed, question one could be perceived as stigmatizing substance use issues and indicating that the medical board is especially interested in these types of impairments. It conflicts with the overall intent of reward, rewording existing application language to provide an opportunity to applicants to honestly share information about current conditions that impair practice. In addition, question one does not include all the ways in which an applicant could be receiving treatment for a condition that impairs their practice and would not accurately provide the board with information on an applicant's ability to practice. It also conveys that the medical board is only interested in these types of treatments over other therapies such as counseling or mental health um, therapy. We recommend removing this question. In place of question two, CMA would like to see a broadly worded question such as, do you currently have any condition for which you are not receiving appropriate care and treatment that impairs your ability to practice medicine safely? And place the applicant on notice that the board does reserve the right to contact the applicant for more information about their untreated condition. It is important that any question focus only on conditions that are current and untreated because the goal is to encourage applicants to seek treatment for conditions that may impair their practice, as well as providing the board notice with things that they need to investigate further. As proposed, we believe that question three is confusing and duplicative um, of proposed question number two. If question two is amended to what I just described previously, no additional questions should be necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions in the audience? I, I, I'm, conf I'm getting confused on this one now. I don't really understand the fear of asking these potential licensees about their past. We're talking about people who are going to be treating us for our health. According to the Journal of Mer American Medical Association, 40 to 60 percent of people with substance use dis disorders relapse. They say, while relapse is a normal part of recovery for some drugs, it can be very dangerous, even deadly. If a person uses as much of a drug as they did before quitting, they can easily overdose because their bodies are no longer adapted to their previous level of drug exposure. I just think you're asking for trouble if you don't get potential licensees' true history with drugs and alcohol. I don't understand not wanting to know this information. Carrie, can I ask a question on that point? My understanding is, from what you're telling us is that it may be unlawful for us to ask those questions. Is that correct? It may be. Yes. Okay. And that we are, we're exposed to litigation if we continue to ask these questions. Right. The other piece is uh, we're getting information for over a long period of time. And so the medical school is asked about unusual circumstances. So people, have, people still have to disclose if they took a leave of absence from a medical school. They have to disclose if they've had um, discipline, if they have been placed on probation, they uh, in residency, again, a long period of time, about to get longer, uh, they're going to have to disclose similar things, leaves of absences and um, unusual circumstances is what we call them. So 
um, if they've had limitations put on their ability to practice. Now all of a sudden they can't do night call. Um, they have to have additional supervision. Those are types of things that are disclosed by the applicant as well as yeah. by the program. And, and so, you know, the thought is if there is a, a problem, including, you know, a longstanding substance use problem, there's opportunities for it to uh, be discovered if it's something that impairs their ability to, to practice safely. None of this is perfect. Um, it, it, again, we also fingerprint, and so we're not going to be able to ask people about convictions coming up, mm -hmm. um, but we're still going to, to get the criminal history that's caught. Um, and so if someone has DUIs, uh, we expect we'll be able to get that in, and ask them about it. Mm -hmm. There's not a motion, I'll move approval of staff's recommendation. I think we yep. have, we have a, a motion, motion well, and a second. Yeah. Good. No. Just have to ask the recommend phone. we vote. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have any um, comments from the phone? We do have a comment coming from Dr. Peter Yoyelis of UC Davis. Your line is open. Hello. First of all, I'd like to thank you very much for addressing this issue. I think it's a very important issue, and the direction that the board is going, I think, is extremely positive. Um, I'm a psychiatrist and the chief wellness officer at UC Davis and have been treating physicians as patients for many years. And I just want to assure the board that there are many doctors who do not seek treatment or who find it threatening to, to seek treatment because of their concern that they may eventually lose their license, even though they have no impairment. Um, and that's a, a common problem. And clearly what, this, what these suggestions are trying to do is to make sure that we don't have sick doctors who are untreated treating patients. Um, so this is ultimately all about patient safety. In terms of the uh, proposals, I would suggest uh, that uh, item one on the, the list of original six uh, suggest, uh, suggestions uh, should not be included at all. Uh, California doesn't have a physician health program, and I think there'll be major definitional, definitional problems that people will have in answering this question as to what actually is a substance abuse recovery program or an impaired practitioner program. Um, I think uh, question three, as written in your document, uh, is very reasonable, and I would support the CMA view that we should include some comment about this uh, uh, disorder being untreated, because it's, this is the issue we want to prevent, untreated doctors <clears throat> treating patients. Uh, and if you assume that uh, question three is included in that way, then question five becomes unnecessary and duplicative. Thank you very much indeed for uh, taking my opinion. Thank you. Any additional question questions? From Michelle Ramos okay. of PSAM, your line is open. Hello, this is Michelle Montrat Ramos, and um, on behalf of consumers and on behalf of someone, actually myself, who's um, been involved in this issue for the past 12 years, because a Californian lost his life at 36 years old due to surgical mistakes by an impaired physician with addiction to crack cocaine. I'm asking you to leave the questions as is, specifically question number one. Had you been, um, had you been accessing the National Practitioner's Database, you would have this information. But since you don't, it's really pertinent to, to protection of consumers to have this information on hand. So again, I'm asking you on behalf of consumers <clears throat> not to revise these questions for potentially impaired physicians. Okay. Do we have any other comments on the phone? No further comments at this time. Okay. Uh, so we have a motion and we have a second. Dr. Bolat. Aye. Ms. Friedman. Yes. Dr. Gonadev. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Kraus? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Yes. Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Yes. Dr. Yip? Aye. 
Ms. Pines. Yes. So given the late hour, we are going to resume tomorrow. We're going to adjourn as of today, and we're going to come back to item number 12 tomorrow morning. <laughs>